Here is the latest Higher Summits forecast brought to you by our friends at the Mount Washington Observatory. Weather above treeline in the White Mountains is often wildly different than at our trailheads. Before you hike, check the Higher Summits forecast at mountwashington.org. Weather observers working at the nonprofit Mount Washington Observatory write this elevation based forecast every morning and afternoon. Search and rescue teams, avalanche experts, and backcountry guides all rely on the Higher Summits forecast to anticipate weather conditions above treeline. You should too. Go to mountwashington.org or text forecast to 603 356 2137. Okay, here is your forecast for Friday, December 8th and Saturday, December 9th. Friday, in the clear under partly sunny skies with a high in the upper teens with northwest winds shifting west at 20 to 30 miles per hour. Wind chill rising to 5 above to 5 below. Friday night, in the clear under increasingly cloudy skies. Low rising to the mid-20s. Winds west shifting southwest at 20 to 35 miles per hour, increasing to 30 to 45 miles per hour with gusts up to 60 miles per hour. And the wind chill will be rising to 5 above to 15 above. Saturday, in the clear under mostly cloudy skies, with a high rising to the lower 30s. Winds southwest shifting west at 25 to 40 miles per hour with gusts up to 55 miles per hour. Wind chill will be rising to 10 above to 20 above. All right, enjoy your weekend. Broadcasting from the Woodpecker Studio in the great state of New Hampshire, welcome to the Sounds Like a Search and Rescue podcast, where we discuss all things related to hiking and search and rescue in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Here are your hosts, Mike and Stump. And we are live, Stomp. Hold on, Mike. I just want to make sure she's rolling, too. Oh, yeah, you're good. Okay, take it from the top. All right, we are live, Stomp. Try that again. You you miss my beer cracking. I always time it so that I open my <laughs> beer up at the beginning of the show, and you screwed oh. up my moment, Stomp. Do, do, I'll keep it, I'll keep it. All right, all right. Don't edit oh, I this got out. it. So, uh, let's just get the intro for Danielle out of the way right now. So Danielle's super nervous, yes. so we might as well just do the... So Danielle, what's your name and who are you? Uh, Danielle Norman. <laughs> I'm a hiker. You're a hiker? Oh, wow. Sorry. See, I told you you could do your introduction. You killed it already. That was Perfect. complicated. That was, that was. But sit tight, Danielle. Me and Stomp are going to riff for a minute, and then we're going to get to you. And then we've got Rebecca here as well. So hello, Rebecca. <clears throat> Hi. Welcome back. Thanks. Excellent. So, Stomp, we've got a big storm coming in. Uh, first big one of the year. What do you think? Uh, a Norincher? Is it going to be a Norincher? It looks like it's going like to be last week? Six to six to 12 inches right now, Sunday night. Where are you hearing that from? Because right here in Thornton, we're looking at like an inch. Rain. It's coming. Yeah. Rain's coming. I see... I read on Twitter today that it was going to be a potential for 6 to 12 inches on Sunday night. So maybe it'll be, be just on like an Twitter. inch of rain, but okay. Twitter told me so. Must right. be a guy. <laughs> <laughs> so listeners need to put Twitter in their toolbox for weather forecasts No, it was from forward. 
it was from the NBC affiliate guy on, um, so it was like, I got it from like boston.com, but then it clicked into like a, a Twitter post and the guy had six to 12 inches in his um, forecast for the mountains. Huh. Okay. All right. I'll so take we'll it. See. I will see. I know, uh, I know the snowmobiling is coming up probably. We're doing orientation in about a week. Danielle, have you gone skiing yet? Places- I have not. Oh, resorts because are went, open. Because I went hiking. Ah, yeah, it's always a trade-off. <laughs> yeah. Where do you yeah. go early season skiing, Danielle? Well, they're like all open right now. Like uh, Pretty Pat's, much. Pat's opens tomorrow. Sunapee opened. Wildcat opened. Adatash opened. Brenton Woods is open. Like Stowe's open. Okemo. <laughs> Almost I'm all always, of them are opening I'll, up. I'm, I'm, I'm always curious, like, what is it like to ski? So I've never skied very early season. I usually don't go until like February or March. What's it like to go to like, say, Bretton Woods or Loon or something like that when it's open right now? There's only like a few trails, right? Well, my friend Ashley went today and she said it was amazing. Um, really? They've been, they got a lot of snow and they've been making snow round clock just because it's been so cold, they canned. Usually, usually December, it's raining by this point. So mm-hmm. they're all trying to jump on it. I drove by Cannon coming down here and they're they're grooming the front five which is not usual in december front five mike that's serious ski talk she right do you know what that is no i don't even know what it's, you're talking it, about i pretended it's, like i did it's the little it's the small like five trails that you can see from the highway of canon mm-hmm. those ah the, gotcha the front ones yeah yeah they look yeah. the ones right by echo lake sure okay. that in, that include avalanche I don't know any names. So Avalanche thinking, is the furthest south. It's a really sharp one. So it's a tram side. Yes. Yeah. So all those little ones on tram side, those are called the front five. Gotcha. Gotcha. Wow. You learn something new every day. Yep. The front five. I'm going to, I'm going to throw that out there. And so I'm gonna, now I'm going to know, <laughs> I'm going to feel like I know what I'm talking about there. So, <laughs> but I've always wanted to like do early season skiing and like go up in the ski lift where there's like no snow under the ski lift, but then you get off and there's a bunch of snow on the trails, but I've never done that. I don't know. I just timing. It's not terrible. It's I've done it on Adatash before. It's weird when you get over and you're like, there's grass underneath me. Yeah. I'm going to grass ski today. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And then Danielle, you're in the studio. So you've got, um, what, that's not Zylo. That's the other one, right? That is Daphne. Luna's missing in action. I don't know where she is. And uh, Zylo comes and goes. He's just scoping things out. No, we but know Danielle's a hardened cat person, so all right. so, so all Rebecca's good. a hardcore cat person. And then Danielle, did, did, how many cats do you have, Danielle? I'm allergic to cats. Oh. <laughs> so you're trying to kill her. Still. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, my roommate used to have a cat. Um, she passed away a few years ago, but I lived with her for five years, and I uh, I love animals. Is what it is. I. Yeah. If I if I touch the cat and then I touch my eyes, then I'll have a problem. But I've learned over the years to not do that. Yeah. So I would think that's a true cat lover. Then if you're allergic, but you still tolerate them, so yeah. Uh huh. All right. Well, keep Daphne under control, <laughs> Stomp. But uh, welcome to episode one thirty two of the Sounds Like a Search and Rescue podcast. This week we are joined by the dynamic duo of Rebecca and Danielle to talk about their recent completion of the White Mountain Red Line slash Trace. Um, and just so that we're clear, like they're dynamic duo because they're here together, but like they've done this all, all this stuff kind of separately, but uh, together a few times. We'll get into it. Um, but this Red Line challenge entails hiking every trail in the White Mountain Guide and is a feat that very few people complete. Uh, so they've both been working on their red lines independently for a number of years and have now completed their goals. So we're going to ask them to reflect on their accomplishments and go through the planning, logistics, struggles, and the triumph of completing what many consider to be uh, one of the most challenging goals in the White Mountains. So in addition to this, we'll talk about uh, an incoming storm. Uh, actually, we already talked about that, so pretend Quack. I didn't say that. Uh, we're going to talk about a lost <laughs> dog story. Uh, we're going to talk about what happens when your parachute doesn't open. Uh, we've got some gear reviews. Uh, we're going to talk about House of Dragons. In our beer drinking segment, we're going to do a deep dive on artificial intelligence that's helping to make IPAs. We've got notable hikes all over the whites, and then we've got recent search and rescues on Kerrigan, Mount Major, Monadnock, and Mount Kearsar. So I'm Mike. And I'm Stomp. Let's get started. (laughs) 
This is Ben Pease from Hiking Buddies. We are a 501c3 nonprofit committed to reducing avoidable tragedies through education, impactful projects, and fostering a community of support. You can find out more at hikingbuddies.org. We wanted to say thank you to those who have supported our mission, and most importantly, say thanks to those who speak up, who ask questions, and who are willing to provide guidance and assistance on the trails when needed. You embody what it means to be a hiking buddy. And now, for all my newer hikers out there, here's this episode's Hiking Buddies Quick Tip. Here's a tip to help you learn the features on a map. Can you remember Hidden Valley Ranch salad dressing? The major features on a map are hill, valley, ridge, saddle, and depression. Again, you can remember it as Hidden Valley Ranch Salad Dressing. Know these on a map to discern if the area is safe for your abilities. Note the elevation, water crossings, scrambles, tent sites, huts, bailout plans, and anything else that might be significant to your hike. All right, so Stomp, we got some housekeeping to do here. So, um, so we're going to have Mike Cherum from Redline in next week. No show on the 29th, no show on January 5th, and then we'll be back on January 12th. Got it. Correct. Okay. Yes, that's right. But that's a nice way to end the year with uh, Redline yeah. guiding. It yeah, should yeah. be fantastic. It'll be fun. And then, um, Stomp, you had a yep. clarification. So Ken from uh, episode 131 had sent in a clarification for us. During the episode, uh, he misspoke at one point. So basically, the clarification is that when canine units are out uh, on searches, they will actually carry Narcan with them just in case they come across uh, a a batch of fentanyl. Uh, So the handlers are carrying Narcan with them as opposed to uh, fentanyl. Dogs are not carrying fentanyl or the handlers are not carrying fentanyl. So just a, a misstatement there. A little clarification. All right, stop. So that's good. Good to know. Um, yeah. So moving on, we got a couple of news articles here. So there is a volcano that erupted in Indonesia, and there's 23 hikers that are presumed to be dead after a volcano in West Sumatra, Indonesia, erupted on Sunday, December 3rd. Officials say that about 75 yeah. people were hiking around Mount Merapi when it erupted. Mm-hmm. So this is a 10,000 foot volcano. And it's one of 127 active yep. volcanoes in Indonesia. The eruption lasted nearly five minutes and spewed ash 9,800 feet into the air. Res- rescue workers evacuated That's 52 amazing. people to shelters. <coughs> um, so, Mike, <coughs> sorry, I'm choking on my beer here. Did you sign the life insurance, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. So... Yeah, so this isn't good. Twenty three people are dead. Stomp. If you would you hike near a volcano, I feel like I wouldn't hike near one if, if it was. That's active. a bad day. <laughs> uh, well, from what I understand, we're near volcanoes anyway at the moment here in New Hampshire. But uh, no, I wouldn't purposely do that. Not in the Pacific uh, area anyway. Uh, by the way, this week has been unbelievable for earthquake activity in that area. They had a. I think it was an 8 or a 7.8 off the coast of the Philippines. And then from there, there's been reverberations all around the whole area with tsunami watches. So it's a uh, tinderbox down there. But no, I would not do that. Would you do that, Danielle? Um, no. Uh, n- no. Not at all. Like, I do the dormant ones. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I would do the same. I did see there was a Netflix special. I think we talked about this before where um, the people, they do that cruise ship thing where they'll go on an excursion and and they they went to this like little island somewhere near Australia. And when they were there, like touring this active volcano, the thing erupted and they, uh, they, some people died. I remember that. A bunch of people. So that was an intense nightmare fuel documentary. Absolutely. Yeah. So anyway, um, there that it was updated uh, yesterday. Twenty three dead, um, uh, mostly climbers and hikers now. So there's yeah, they're presumed dead at this point. So that's a shame. Anyway, here's some good news. <laughs> yep. And then next off, we've 
Yeah, we had a story here. A dog went missing nearly two months ago and was found alive by a pair of hikers what? on a trail in Car- Colorado. So the two hikers sp- spotted the Bernice Mountain Dog um, at a park on November 19th without her owner in sight. And they decided to try to befriend the injured and scared dog in the hopes of bringing the pup down the mountain to safety. Uh, they tried to carry it and the dog bit them. So, uh, <laughs> despite that, the sheriff's office said both hikers refused to give up. And um, one of the hikers remained on the trail with the animal while the other went down for medical help to give the rescue as the dog's location. So, then rangers and animal control officers were able to hike up on the trail and they brought the dog down to safety. So, um, I guess one of the rangers remembered a couple of months back that there was a lost dog poster in the park. And they connected the owner um, with the dog, so all good. And the dog's name is Nova, 14 months, and it was a service dog in training. So I have a feeling that that dog is flunking out of service dog school. But Uh Every dog gets a free bite. Well, it survived, though. Yeah, it sure did. did. Tenacious little guy, huh? Or gal. Yeah, yeah. I love these Bernice Mountain Dogs. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, what it is. So I actually follow um, two Bernese Mountain Dogs on TikTok that I'm obsessed with. Uh, they're called Walter and Gus. Oh, really? And I'll link them in the show notes. Oh, they're amazing. Huh. Like the owner, they're in Boston somewhere. I think they're in like Waltham or Burlington or something like that. And they, she does this thing where uh, the owner, like basically, it was, Walter was a only dog. And then um, they got the dog a puppy named Gus. So they're both Bernese mountain dogs. Yeah. And the mother, she does like a voiceover. <laughs> she uses that Phineas and Ferb voice. Do you know what I'm talking about, Stomp? Uh-huh. Oh yeah, sure do. So she uses the Phineas and Ferb and like the whole thing about the 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 social media channel is like Walter hates Gus and he's always complaining about how annoying Gus is. And then you just sort of walk through a day in the life of the Bernese mountain dog. So I'll link it in the show notes if people want to watch. I like it. All right, we'll keep a lookout. Okay. You didn't sound very interested, Stone. <laughs> well, it's not as interesting as Danielle and Zyla at the moment, so I, I drifted off for a second, but I'm back. Zylo is jumping up on Danielle's lap and Stomp's taking pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know how this goes. It's not often we have guests here, so... Right. Stomp, uh, can, can we get through the news here? Yeah, sure. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> oh, this should be fun, uh, huh? Oh, yeah. Stomp's going to get mad now. So we have an update on, um, there was a national park that they were trying to let, um, I guess, um, migrants take over and the House of Representatives passed legislation preventing um, the use of the national use parks. Of this national park. Yeah. yeah. So this doesn't even look like a national park. It looks like some abandoned island in New York. I feel, I feel like they should just let them all live there if they want to live there. Yeah. Well, it's a little more complicated than that, but there's rumors now that they want to expand that that whole effort to national parks across the nation because there's just so many people. There's just no place to put them. Um, so, yeah, it, it passed the House bipartisan. There was six Democrats that joined, apparently, and now it's going to the Senate. Uh, and we'll see what happens there. I just, uh, I'm super curious about where all the eco warriors are and whatnot. <laughs> it's like everybody's silent on this. Like, hey, let's use the national parks. Um, who knows? We'll see what happens. So it's the latest on the national park saga. Okay. Yep. We'll, we'll post that in the show notes and people can check it out if they want. Yeah. Next up, Stomp pulled the amazing story of Joan Murray. Holy moly. <clears throat> so. Yeah, so this is not a hiking story, but do you, do you want to it get a recap on this one? It's unbelievable. Oh, it, it's unbelievable. Does anybody know this story, Joan no. Murray? Do you? Have you? All right, all right. Because I didn't want to put it in here for no reason, but it was such an extraordinary tale. I'll set, set this up. Okay, imagine all of us are in a plane. We're at 15,000 feet, okay? Everybody with me? We're ready to jump out. We're parachuting out of the plane. Is she parachuting with like some guy like strapped? to her or whatever that uh, is tandem she by herself that's tandem yeah no yeah. i think she's solo in this in this one because the story reveals that later so she okay. she jumps she's flying through the air fifteen thousand feet that's like what three mount washington's right 12, Just above uh, mount two and a half oh yeah 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 okay <laughs> i like going she reaches back and pulls for the first parachute and it fails all right so as she's falling 
she starts to tumble and she's out of control. So she gets down to literally 700 feet, which would be just for reference, Cannon Cliffs are maybe hovering around well, 900 for the old man and then like 1200 somewhere in that ballpark. So she's at 700 feet and she pulls her backup chute, which releases, but because she's already out of control, it just basically fails to do anything. So she, she ultimately smashes into the ground, 15,000 foot drop. She's falling at what? 80 miles an hour or the, the speed of gravity. I forget what that is exactly fast. So she's <laughs> toast, right? Clearly not. <laughs> so well, I mean, I would die of a heart attack the second my parachute <laughs> didn't open up. Yeah, well, here's the extraordinary thing. She hits the ground, but she lands on uh, an ant mound of fire ants. And what happens, They thousands of them start stinging her with their venom. And the venom uh, basically acts as a massive adrenaline surge into her body and she survives this fall this is an actual story does she have bones left i i have no idea about the recovery but i'm going to do some digging because i want to (laughs) know this was this is quite a while back uh what 2000s if i read that correctly but she just passed away 1999 okay 1999 wow so she just passed away in 2022 can you believe that yeah yeah this happened in south carolina was it from complications I would assume that she was pretty arthritic and messed up just long term after that, but what an amazing tale. So we will add that story to the notes and uh, do some digging. I've never heard anything quite like that. So Stomp, that was her 36th jump. So she was an experienced jumper. Yeah. Well, normally you can't jump by yourself without having jumped so many times. I have a few friends that do it and they're like, yeah, I have to get so many in before I can actually do solo. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, a risky sport. Yeah, that makes sense. A little bit. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> they said that the they said that she landed in a um like a pile of fire ants and because <laughs> the fire ants stung her that like shocked her heart so that she didn't die or something. Yeah. Wild. Mm. So it's a miracle. No. That that's in the category of miracles, no question about it. So. I feel like there's other stories about people like f- not having their parachutes open where they've survived. I feel like there was a guy in Australia where that happened too. So I'm going to do some more research and we'll maybe we'll get another story. <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> Are you ready for Slasher's Ear Review? Uh, and then Stomp, you pulled a story about uh, a gear review, something about a weight boot covers for mud and water crossings. Yeah, um, I've seen oh, some. We've tried these Stomp, though. Y- yeah, we sure did. Well, they work. They, they do. They horrible. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Trash bags. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I saw some posts from some friends of ours, um, and they were tackling, the, I think it was the Gale River Trail, and they were using trash bags, and they're occurred to me that you know they offer farm boots that are made from mud and water that are whoa <laughs> attacking a kitty on rebecca's camera it's thomas it's gotta be thomas <laughs> so i uh just wanted to remind people that there are uh commercial options out there instead of trash bags but feel free to do the trash bags the thing with the u-line boots um they're plastic but they don't have a long life i mean they're good for probably a river crossing and that's about it maybe two they do fade fast, but uh, they're out there, and you can get about, I think it's maybe 25 or 50 for really dirt cheap. But how heavy are they? They don't weigh a thing. They're oh. ju- literally just, it's like having a, a gallon uh, plastic bag, sandwich is, bag. Is it just an expensive bag? It's, it's expensive plastic, yeah, okay. pretty much. But it's tailored to a boot. It's a boot shape. Yeah. Yeah, what Stomp is talking about is they're called U-Line waterproof boot covers, and they're essentially just like little trash bags where they pull up over your boots up to your, like right below your kneecap, and then you can put them in and walk in the water. And we we used them, we we use them on Lincoln Woods, like the the second section right below um, Bondcliff Trail, right? Yeah, and it was so muddy when we started that trip. I think we tried them on that Pemi Loop. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm sort of of the mind that if it's always if it's going to be really muddy, if it's not cold out, like I just I just get my feet wet and just get let's go you know, for it. I just get wet early on, and then it doesn't bother me as much. Yeah, I mean, for a Pemi loop though, that would be a bad start. <laughs> Thirty miles yeah. in wet boots. <laughs> true, true. Yeah, so but no, I get it. All right, and uh, I wanted to give everyone a heads up. I caught this online. I think John Swindlehurst, so shout out to John. Um, he had posted this on one of the uh, the hiking groups. There's a map that I'll share on our uh, show notes called uh, NAR Map, and this is a map that will show you snow depth. So um, you can look at this and it'll tell you how deep the snowpack is in uh, in different areas. This time of the year, it's nice because you can kind of look to see where the heavier, heavier snow starts in New Hampshire and Vermont. So NAR, was N-A-R. Pretty, pretty good. Yeah, G-N-A-R. Oh, okay. It's Gnar. Map. Gnar. <laughs> yeah, Gnarly, yeah, Gnar. man. Gnarly. <laughs> like, yeah, like Gary Gnu, Gnar map. <laughs> Um, and it's pretty good so far. I've been looking at it, and when you look at it, it's really just like Mount Carrigan up to Lincoln Woods has like the deepest snow right now. It's showing, I think, like 20 to 30 inches of snow on the ground. Holy moly. Well, Danielle will talk about her recent hike, but uh, she's saying there's a ton up by Monroe. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's showing the same there. It's showing like uh, 20 to 30. It's at least from, my, uh, my leg length. <laughs> my leg? My leg. Yeah. At least <laughs> to my hip. And that's right. like. Well, you're, that's, you're sort of tall, so that's, that's good. That's like over three feet. Yeah, yeah. I would say. Yeah. That's more of a yardstick. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Danielle's a giant, so it's, that's a lot of stuff. <laughs> She's taller than I am. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm almost six. What are you? Are you yes. probably six, huh? No, I've five. gotten shorter. I'm like five nine. Oh, okay. I was five ten once. I must have been slouching then today. <laughs> okay. All right, and then this next one, I, I'm interested in people's opinions on this one. So I was had to go into the office today, Stomp. So I was in Con- oh, Cambridge, bummer. and uh, yeah, it was fun to uh, fun to drive in. But <laughs> Cambridge has a new initiative where they have uh, added 2,500, oh no, actually they've added, they had a vote of 2,500 residents that passed this initiative to add 70 new street signs in East Cambridge, which will include translations into native American language. So I guess the, you know, original, the Massachusetts tribe language. So the way it's set up is you'll have like the stop sign and then under the stop sign is this little like um, smaller version of a stop sign that says Aquish, which is stop in Native American. And then they have like street signs, which is going to be like first street is going to be called Nikoni Takamako (laughs) or something. So um I guess apparently they're doing this as a nod to the first people or the first in the native population that lived here before um, this area was colonized here. So mm. uh, I don't know how much money this is costing. Exactly. That was my question. That, Tax dollars. Well, here's the other thing is that it's always interesting. Like I've learned through the years of doing this podcast, when you research, especially Native American um, words, Primarily, when you come up with the spelling for these words, what ends up happening is that the the initial settlers who didn't ha- they weren't able to write, they would pick up the language phonetically from the natives that they interacted with, mm-hmm. and then pass that on to the second generation of settlers who were more mm-hmm. educated and could write. So, a lot. If you look at the early maps, like Kankamangus, Musilaki, Pemigewasset, like there's seven different spellings for all of those. And over the years, the spellings eventually just get settled on by whoever sold the most sort of maps or, or books back in like the late 1800s. So, the accuracy of these words is probably pretty um, pretty dubious at this point. But I guess it feels good to you know give a shout out to. The Native Americans in Cambridge. So, uh, but I just thought it was interesting that they're going to do this. Yeah, it is interesting. What's the um, population of Native Americans in Cambridge? Like one? 
right now, I couldn't imagine, I couldn't imagine it's that, that big. Hey, so. well, hope somebody enjoys it anyway. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, but I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to go over to East Cambridge next time I'm in there. And I'll check out some of the signs, but I thought it was an interesting story. Oh, does uh, Elizabeth Warren live there? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I She's couldn't resist. Um, well, Elizabeth Warren does live in Cambridge, but she lives over by Harvard Square. Um, I forget the name of the street because I've been over there before. So, I mean, my family's from Cambridge and I've worked in Cambridge for years, so I'm around there quite a bit. But mm. um, we try to keep this yeah, apolitical, I know. by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know where you're going with that. I know where you're going with that. Hey, what's that sound? It must be time for the pop culture segment with Mike and Stomp. All right. So, uh, well, speaking of politics, Stomp, we've got House of uh, House of Dragon season two trailer is coming out. <laughs> Excellent! I'm so excited. What did you think of the trailer? I figured uh, you could give us a little primer on what to expect. Yeah, I thought it was good. I was picking out a couple of the characters that I think are going to be involved in this. So yeah. uh, things are going to get ugly. People are going to get killed. It's going to get really bad um, in this season. So what you saw in season one was <laughs> was pretty amazing. And it ended on a violent tone. Yeah. The violence is going to amp up significantly. There's going to be a lot of like people get killed, and then there's going to be a lot of new characters that show up to replace them. And those characters are not going to be nice people. Hmm. Yeah, I need a refresher. Have you seen this show? It's, I don't really uh, watch TV much. Yeah, you seem too busy. <laughs> You'd have to have like a TV strapped on your head. To, I have a TV. I hiking. pay a lot of money for a subscription on Comcast. Yeah. Um, that's about it. How about you, Rebecca? Have you watched any of this stuff? I don't know what that means. No, okay. Yeah, it's more nerdy nerdy stuff. Um, anyway, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. What's the name of that gigantic uh, dragon? That massive old school dragon that they show in this preview? Remember that? I forget. Is yeah, this like forget, Dungeons so. and Dragons? You no, know, it's like, well, it's, it's um, what, what would you say? Medieval type of, it's like Lord of the Rings but it's more uh, political. Yeah, it's a TV show. It's high fantasy. It's it's pol- political in the sense that you have all these families trying to vie for the the crown and or the throne in this case. And uh, yeah, it's it's, it's complicated. It, yeah, you you'd call it like high fantasy, and then the the political aspect of it is just so it's based on War of the Roses, which was like a, a political conflict in the the British royal family back in like the I don't even know fifteen hundreds or something like that. Yeah. But the um, the biggest dragon you're talking about, Stomp, is Vagar. Vagar. Okay. Yes. I'm looking forward to seeing Vagar on screen. Yes. <laughs> Oh boy! Very good. Uh, next up, Stomp, you pulled a little update here. So Spotify is going to lay off seventeen percent of the workforce. So podcasts are not si- doing well, apparently. Yeah, that's pretty significant. There, um, the article cites higher costs. I'm not sure what costs they're talking about. Whether it be what electrical costs, perhaps, or it's got to be. I mean, the, their increased cost has to be on the content side. I mean, that's the only only thing I can think of is just acquiring the music and the content has oh, to be I see more and more expensive for them. Interesting. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Um, so yeah, the, apparently in twenty two they had eight thousand employed, so seventeen percent. It's a good chunk, and they're expecting to lay off some more coming up over the next year. Yeah, that's a big hit. That's a big hit. But I think yeah. tech companies in general are finding that they can continue to maintain their technical infrastructure with less and less people. They're getting more efficient. They're figuring out ways to automate. So um, it's interesting right now in the tech market. Yeah. All right. Well, I love it. I still love it. It's a great, great app. And yep. um, next we have the finale of Squid Games. The challenge. I'm done with 287. 287 can jump off a bridge. <laughs> is really? that a person? <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, this is a, uh, a a new version of the Squid Games where actual people uh, participated. They had like over 400 people start, and it came down to three. And um, did you see the finale yesterday, Mike? Nope, I have not seen the finale. Oh, all right. I will now shut my mouth then. It. Yes. So it is. F- very interesting, and uh, I think the last game they play will take you by surprise. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. 
Okay. Yes. I'm rooting for 451, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll keep my mouth shut. But okay. Good stuff. So, hey, we're moving on. We have a um, free sticker reminder. You can get your stickers at the new shop of Ski Fanatics off Exit 28 in Campton or at Spinner's Pizza Parlor in Andover off Dascom Road 93. Um, quick shout out to Reckless Brewing where you can get the best beer and grub just minutes from the 4,000 footers and the five corners. And then thank you, EMS, the Northeast go-to for gear, guidance, and more. We have a couple coffee donations this week, and uh, we love seeing those come in. They're really helpful. We have one uh, coffee that was sent by Pottery by Natural, and then Lance and Camila uh, donated 10 coffees. So that was super cool. Thank you, everybody, for that. Um, Let's see. We also have our Fieldstone Kombucha sponsor, which is... um, the latest sponsor, they're back for a round with us, and we're glad to have them. And I just lost the plug here in my phone, so why don't you talk for a moment, Mike? <laughs> dead air. No dead air. I'm going to let you suffer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here we go. I got it. So, Fieldstone Kombucha, New England's premium craft kombucha company. If you're in the heart of New England, you need to drink a New England-style kombucha. Softer, less acidic, and truly enjoyable. Our kombucha is naturally effervescent and boasts full-bodied flavor. Fieldstone crafts the best seasonal flavors. When we tell you there's blueberries in our baby bandit flavor, it nearly turns your tongue blue. Women-owned and operated, we brew in Rhode Island using whole locally sourced ingredients. Fieldstone kombucha is the perfect replenishing drink after a day on the slopes or a trek in the woods. It's chock full of probiotics and healthy acids to keep you in top form. Find us at Biederman's in Plymouth, New Hampshire, Mad River Coffee House in Campton, the Concord Food Co-op, and more. Check out our website for the full list of New Hampshire and New England-wide locations. Use code SLASHER. S-L-A-S-R on our website for 10% off an online order shipped straight to your door. And that's FieldstoneKombuchaCo.com. Cool. Yeah, Rhode Island. You did, you did excellent stomp. Thank you very much. It's tough. It's tough reading for a minute straight without <laughs> effing up. Yes. Uh, so this is the part of the show where we talk about what beer we are drinking, stomp. Oh, do you want to start? Let's let's have, uh, well, we know Rebecca's... Uh, Teetotaling, right? <laughs> You're not, you don't drink alcohol, correct? No. All right. All right. All right. Let's let's go to Danielle and see what she brought tonight. Can you see that? Yeah. Uh, out of order. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's a double mango sorbet, which is an American sour, out oh. of Cambridge, Maryland. Cambridge, Maryland. Did you bring that yourself, Danielle? I did. Found oh, wow. it in my fridge. I bought it a, a little while ago. And it's still there. Do you prefer the sours over the uh, IPAs and other types of beer? IPAs are terrible. <laughs> you like the, I cannot do you IPAs. like the fruity oh. stuff. I like sours. I love them. They've grown on me over the last three years. What do you got, Mike? I have Cloud Candy, which is a New England IPA by... Um, Night Squirrel Brewing Company. So I think I had I had these a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. So see that sounds like a sour, but then it's an IPA. It's so- yeah, yeah, cloud candy. I would have bought that thinking it was a sour, <laughs> right? And then I'd have been very <laughs> so, disappointed. Uh-oh. Yeah, you could have given it to me. <laughs> Here we go. And I am drinking a Woodstock Brewery um, beer, and it's for it's a benefit for. The New England Disabled Sports. So I saw that and I'm like, oh, that's super cool. So it's a New England India Pale Ale and it's called Breaking Boundaries IPA. And um, it says here, the Woodstock Inn Brewery will donate $1 from each four-pack sold to New England Disabled Sports. Enjoy this hazy, hoppy New England IPA while raising money for a great organization. It tastes really good. It's good stuff. Stop. Remember, remember when you used to like make Mai Tais and all kinds of fancy drinks? <laughs> I know. 
Yeah, those are the days, huh? Yes. I'm just too busy. I can't do it. Got to wake up Shame fresh in the morning. <laughs> All right. And then you've got some stuff here about like um, artificial intelligence creating beer recipes or something. This is really interesting. So Mr. and Mrs. Stomp, we went away this last weekend to um, the Indian Head Resort just for a random, random mini vacation. Right there. Super funny. So we're on Wow. The- way, way to go like, you know, really far away. <laughs> we have a heated pool. <laughs> oh, that, that's why we went. We were like, oh, we need a sauna. We need the pool. <laughs> And it was really fantastic. But on the way, we hit Wayne's Market, which is in Woodstock. I grabbed a four-pack, and it was called AIPA. And it was a beer that was created by a brewing company in Everett, Massachusetts, called Night Shift Brewing. And it was the it was labeled as... They're claiming it was the first beer to be created by AI. And it made the recipe. It made the graphics. It actually brewed it, if I remember correctly. So I'm like, oh, that sounds intriguing. So I and they used Chat GPT to make the recipe. Uh, the beer was absolutely fantastic. So I went down the rabbit hole and did some more research. There are others out there, and um, I don't know if Night Shift Brewing in Everett was the first because there were others. Like there's Deep Liquid New Orleans. They they had uh, some press in June 2022. Detroit based brewery brewery. Uh, is uh, maybe February 23. And then there's Rio Bravo Brewing, March 23. And then the last one I found was Intelligent X. I have some news articles about them dating back to like 2019. So this AI brewing thing is really interesting. Yeah, I can't imagine like anything in 2019 would have been like notable for artificial intelligence, but... Who knows? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, keep a lookout for it. I've had some chats in the background with uh, Reckless Steve, and he's aware. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, what's the deal with Indian Head? Like, can you go up on that, like, tower there if you're a guest, or is that just open on certain times? I really don't know. Uh, we didn't venture into that area. It looks as though it's accessible, but nobody was on it when we were there. You would think that somebody would be on it if we were there. It I was a huge wedding. I stayed wedding. there once. Yeah? For a wedding. Okay. But it was snowing out. So they didn't. We also were not probably in the right state. Yeah, you of were mind no shape <laughs> to start climbing something. But I don't think it was open because of the weather. Okay. So I, I mean, it looked like it was open, but we didn't try. And I don't think you need to be a guest there to go up. Interesting. Because huh. it's not like there's somebody there standing there being like, room? Right, so. right. Yeah. Well, even with the hot tub and the pool, there was really nobody supervising that either. Somebody I know who used to live around here said that locals used to go there knowing they wouldn't check, and then they started doing bracelets. Right. We got a, a green while. green bracelet. They didn't have bracelets back in 2011 when I stayed there. <laughs> and we didn't know there was a pool that was heated. We didn't even know that until we left. Yeah. But honestly, Mike, it was a good time. It, we felt it like we were in the middle of nowhere, you know, 20 minutes away from home. And it was so much fun. The gift shop is amazing. We got some cool stuff because it's, it's where the Betty and Barney Hill historic marker is. So everything's, mm-hmm. you know, themed with the UFOs. And we got a magnet with that observation tower with a UFO on top of it hovering. It's stuff like that, like really cool schlocky stuff. Uh, but it was great. Yeah, no, I love the roadside stuff. And yeah. uh, you know what I was thinking too is this would be a cool place to stay at, but I also have always had my eyes on that Adventure Suites in North Conway because they have <laughs> they have like the um I've seen those. the it's haunted funny. room or whatever. Have you well, have you stayed there, Danielle? No, I just drove by there and myself and a few <laughs> others stayed at a 59.99 motel up the road. That was quite nice actually. <laughs> But we, I drove by and I was like, huh. They have like a, um, they have a room that you can stay in. And I don't know if it's just around Halloween, but it's literally like a house of horrors where like it'll wake you up and it makes all kinds of noise and like a drawer will open up and close. And it's, it's this weird like experience that you can stay there. So I, I've always been curious about that. I know Jimmy Chaga has taken, um, to, you know, he stayed there before and taken his, his you know, yeah. I think his son there. <clears throat> well, he was the one that inspired um, us to try Indian Head because they, him and Jenny yeah. swear by it. And it was great. Oh, it yeah. was a good time. Yeah. Uh-huh. All right. Well, that's good, Stomp. So that was the part of the show where we talk about recent hikes. 
I have nothing. I traded my boots for a bathing suit last weekend, so I got nothing. How about you? I got nothing either. I had to pay oh. the uh, <laughs> I had to pay the wife tax. I did. This I is a to... hiking podcast. We Clearly. Got... <laughs> well, so so you guys. I don't know if you can appreciate this, but like uh, my wife's pretty good. Like she lets me go hiking. I do my weekends, but every once in a while, like she'll start on like, oh, I have to get this done or that done. So she's wanted to get the kitchen painted for a long time, and it honestly need to be painted. So. <laughs> It was kind of crappy yeah. weather, and I was kind of regretting it because actually, um, Camilla and Lance, who had given the, the nice enough to give us the coffee, had reached out and they were like, "We're going hiking on Mount Jackson." I was like, "I really want to go," but I had yeah. to. I had to stay home and paint. So Mrs. Mike oh. has to stay happy, or I can never go hiking. What now? What did you paint exactly? I painted the kitchen, so I had to do a ceiling and then uh, the walls of the kitchen. But it's hard because oh. there's no big walls, so it was a lot of like taping, a lot of prep, a lot of plastic around the um, the cabinets, and uh, a lot of edging. Gotcha, gotcha. So it well. wasn't like I could just roll it, roll it on. It was just a lot of detail. Gotcha. Well, good job. Good job. So no, uh, no hikes. So why don't we just get into our listeners' notable hikes here, Stomp? We got a bunch. Yeah. Oh, oh. Did you want? Well, Danielle did uh, Monroe. Did you want to talk about that briefly? Because it sounds pretty epic with the snow. Just to touch upon the snow depth. Yeah. I so I started. I did snowshoes from car to car. I could have probably spiked. I don't know half mile, mile up. Yeah. But I had enough that my snowshoes weren't going to break, and. I don't, I'd rather not carry them. So, um, everybody bare booted because okay. I only know that because I had to make a path at some point, like wider than the path. Like it was just footpath. Yeah. And then once you got up to towards the, the top crossing before you start really heading up, um, yeah. and there was probably one to two foot post holes there. Wow. And I'm like, how do you even keep going? <laughs> And then I got up even further, and then there was some spruce traps before the hut. Yeah. And then I saw bear boot going to Washington still. So there's somebody who still continued to Washington with bear boots. But when I went up Monroe, there was no prints anymore. So it was so windy that the you know the ground's moving pretty much. Yeah. And then um, I was trying to like I met the one guy who had snowshoes above me who's kind of just put them on not long before me, um, before I saw him, and uh, I got tried to turn because you know how Monroe it kind of switchbacks it, yeah switchbacks which you can't see anything when there's snow sure um but I hit a spruce trap and it went up all the way to my hip and I was in snowshoes with my televators up and I was like oh popped out of that and I was like televators down light feet light feet oh, wow. um so I was surprised of how much snow was up there mm-hmm. it just I don't know if it was drifting or it just filled all the crevices and everything but yeah that is the north side I mean you would think that there'd be more there perhaps but but even coming up to it it was it was pretty deep yeah well that's encouraging yeah yeah i'm hoping for a good good winter here how about you rebecca anything for uh recent hikes uh i went on i think tuesday or wednesday i just did unconunic i've been getting into running so i've been more doing that um i haven't really been hiking as much i've only been going i think that was my first hike in two weeks and prior to that i did pierce and um, I've been working a lot. I <laughs> I need to replenish my funds after taking basically 16 months more or less off from life. That's like adulting, so <laughs> and responsibility. So I've been really busy, not on trail. Gotcha, gotcha. Awesome. What's unkanunkunk? Unkanunik. 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 They're the Gosstown boobs. Isn't that what that means? Yes. Is that a yeah, trailless I, or trailed? They're, the, they're trailed. Okay. Huh. Interesting. So south. Yeah, it's right in Goffstown. Gotcha. Okay. It's literally right next to where I live. So it's like 10 minutes away. I just drive over and do one of the peaks or two of them, yeah. depending on my mood. And it was more or less an impromptu decision to go do a hike after doing a run. Yeah. Good for you. That's, so I just, uh, that's great. Yeah. Now, what's your solution for running with the snow and the icy conditions coming onto the local roads and things? I run on um, my treadmill or at Livingston Park, and currently there has not been any snow there. Okay. Yeah. 
I don't run on a road. I would not. I live in Manchester. Gotcha. Like on a very busy road. Mm-hmm. It would not be a good choice yeah. to run on. It would force you to run <laughs> fast. It would force me to run off the road <laughs> and probably get hit because it doesn't have any shoulder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, yeah, no it's kidding. sketchy. All right, cool. Well, I'm trying to figure out the whole traction thing for running. It's I haven't been able to run recently because it's so icy here already, and I don't feel like running. It's not enough to put that on my crampons like my uh katulas you know what i mean so you could annoying. get the yak track thingies yeah yeah i could look for those they're probably I feel like they would hurt with the pounding yeah yeah it's really frustrating it's this this shoulder season for runners in a sense i guess hey before we move on to notable hikes danielle i'm curious like did you come back down Amanusik, or how did you come back to come down i did i was gonna go over to washington but um with the like the wind was just so strong that I was like, mm, I don't need Washington. I uh, I'll be good. So I just came right back down ammo. Um, slid. How bad is it going down the uh, ammo? It's I slid once or twice, but I ski. You know, so I know a lot of people. Yeah. There's a few people that are like, how are you? How are you so comfortable with that? I was like, well, I ski. So it's almost like you're skiing down at times, but um, mm-hmm. it's not terrible. I would prefer not to go down the ammo, but I've done it a few times. Is that glare? Is that sheet of no. glare ice just below the the hut there yet, or is it covered? Covered. Oh, good. Because that's I could, the scariest I, thing. I could see a few spots, but it there's still snow on top of it. Okay, good. They got some fresh snow, probably an inch or two. Yeah. Over the last night or two. Okay. That can be intimidating trying to get down that glare yeah. ice when it's there. Mm-hmm. Whew. Stomp, are you going on Saturday to that hike? On uh, the weather doesn't look great. I'm appending because tomorrow my truck's getting inspected and Mrs. Stomp's car failed inspection last week, so I have to do her rotors and pads uh, this tomorrow, being Friday or today when this episode comes out, so we'll see how it goes. If it bleeds in the Saturday, then no, I I just got to get this stupid car stuff done. I'm looking yeah, forward to okay. it, though. I haven't hiked with that crew. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see how yeah. it goes. Um, all right, stomp. So notable hikes here. We got a big list. So we got to get to, we got to get the Danielle. No, exactly. Let's, Let's cruise do this. So we have notable hike of the week. If you want to tag slasher, do so. And we, uh, may consider you for the hike of the week. It's been a few weeks. So I'll just zip through these quickly. Maybe, uh, Danielle and Rebecca can pick their fave. Okay. So pay attention. Okay. <laughs> uh, solo hikes did lonesome lake before reckless show, uh, Pretty cool. Zoe the dog hit Lonesome, Cannon, and Mount Hale for 7 out of 48. Mr. Conley Hikes did the moats. I.W. Tet did the eaglet and watcher. And I recall pictures being somewhat snowy on that adventure. That friggin' hiker did a wintry Mount Tecumseh. Eric J72 also did Tecumseh. C. Gothberg saw a sunrise from Sawyer Mountain on the Connecticut River. Beautiful pictures. I reposted some of those. Ginger Beard did uh, South Peak and Musalak. Brady Girl 1, Table Rock, another one that I'm dying to get up to. Rhonda Willett, uh, single year in New Hampshire 48 and round three on Wildcat D. Uh, let's see. We have another one from Ginger Beard Keen, Fliberty. Uh, Fliberty meaning... Flume and Liberty, for those that aren't aware. Full Strength Coffee made it out to Owl's Head to Mount Martha. This is not the Pemi Owl's Head. This is the one up by uh, Twin Mountain and Cherry Mountain. E.C. Banks is now at 321 out of 576 for his grid on Owl's Head. And uh, he's reporting, he was reporting thin snow. These go back a few weeks. And a couple more here. We have Hiking Feeds My Soul. Kirasage North for 20 out of 52 of the view for Miles the dog. Miles the dog. <laughs> I put four miles like Miles the dog. Oh, yeah, it's a dog. Jake and Julie, Mount Crescent in Randolph with a cold. Aw. Tim Trotter, 58, Mount Mitchell, the highest peak east of the Mississippi at 6,684 feet. That's impressive. I didn't know that uh, we had some big ones out there. Robert Boyd uh, hit Avalon. A. Folsom 33. Adams via Crag Camp. Nick hikes and plays guitar. Tackled Middle Sister and Chikora. And then, of course, Dave shits in the woods. 
did an epic bushwhack, including Mount Oscar, Rosewood, Stickney, and Echo for like like 10 miles bushwhacking. So that's your list. Any uh, favorites out of that list? <laughs> I'll go with Mount Mitchell. I would say Mount, Mount, <clears throat> Mount Mitchell. That was Tim Trotter 58. That's my That's my pick. Have you been there? Yeah, I would oh, say that's unique. So, yeah, that's down in, uh, what's that, North, North Carolina? North Carolina, Tennessee. Uh, North yeah. Carolina, I think it's that one. Because Klingman's Dome is the tallest on the AT. Yeah. And that's in technically mm-hmm. Tennessee, like on the line. Okay, cool. Yeah, we'll get to that. So let's jump into their segment, Mike, because I can do some ads a little bit later before we do Search and Rescue. It's time for Slasher's Guest of the Week. Very cool. Very cool. Do you have a sweat problem? Sweat can be extremely uncomfortable on the trails. Plus, sweat is a serious risk factor. As your clothes get wet, your core temperature can dramatically fluctuate. This can result in hypothermia, heat exhaustion, and dehydration. We've got good news at Slasher for you. There is a piece of gear that solves the sweat problem. Vaucluse's Ultralight Ventilation Backpack Frame. The frame is a backpack accessory that easily installs in your favorite pack, size 15 liters to 65 liters and creates a ventilating airflow between you and your pack. It's also ultralight, weighing less than a pair of socks at just over 3 ounces. Whether you're hiking in hot or cold temps, the ultralight ventilation backpack frame is a real game changer when it comes to airflow and ventilation. So, visit VaucluseGear.com to order an ultralight ventilation frame today. Use promo code SLASHER, S-L-A-S-R, to enjoy a $5 discount. Plus, let them know that Mike and Stomp sent you. Okay, all right. So, Danielle and Rebecca, this is your big segment. So, um, I think I'll start off to just give a little bit of background to the listeners. So, uh, Danielle and Rebecca are our friends. Um, We've known them for a long time. So, Rebecca's been on the show a bunch of times. Danielle, we've tried to get her on a few times, but she's avoided us up until now. We finally captured her. Understandable. Rebecca's fault. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So thank you, Rebecca, for getting her here. But I think we've known each other through social media. And um, Danielle, I think we've we've met through Reach the Beach. We've met um, on Trail. We've done, I think, a triathlon together. And then I know you know Stomp as well. So um, yeah, so that's all yeah. good stuff. And then Rebecca, obviously, you've been on the show like three or four times now. So um, we've kind of followed Frequent your journey. Flyer. So we're looking forward to catching up with both of you. Yeah. <laughs> Rebecca is the frequent flyer. Yeah, yeah, she is. So um, we'll let you guys introduce yourself in a second, but we're going to be talking about um, the red line slash trace. So I thought that I would I would just throw the smelly fish out on the table, as we like to say in the business world. <laughs> the um, elephant. And just talk about like the, so this redlining and trace is essentially like the goal is to hike all the, all the trails in the White Mountain Guide. Uh, Up until like about a year or two ago, everybody was settled on this being called redlining. And then there was a little bit of a controversy where, um, you know, there was a group of hikers that had pushed to get the name changed because they felt like the term redline was an offensive term that was used um in segregating back in the um civil rights era or pre-civil rights era and uh that it had negative con- connotations and we if you wanted to get into deep dive we covered it on like episode three <laughs> and back then <laughs> i was sort of the of the a long time ago but i was always of the perspective that like okay well we should be respectful and i'm going to change the wording from red line to trace but in the last three years or so i've sort of seen like the 
the kind of vibe around like this this language policing and things like that. I don't necessarily think that it's actually a good thing to sort of seed some of this wording anymore. I've seen just seen a lot of bad things happen around it. So from my perspective, I think you could call it redlining, you can call it trace, you call it whatever you want. But I don't know, Danielle, Rebecca, Stomp, if you guys have any perspective on this. I mean, we'll use the term redline, we'll use the term trace interchangeably, but I don't know if anybody has any sort of post-mortem on this that they want to talk about. Hmm. Anybody? Yeah, I mean, it's... (laughs) It's, it's sort of complicated. The English but. language, every word has five different meanings. Well, right. That's my so, take on it, too. Red line. Like, you can red line a car. Red line a car. You can red line on Microsoft. You can... Yeah. There's so many different definitions. Yeah. Yeah, that's my take on it, more or less. Um, I'm, I am interested in the current take on it by the, the uh, hiking community. So, what what's going on out there in some of these more popular social media sites, Mike, or anybody? I don't know, to be honest with you. I think that um, there was a group that was dedicated to redlining and tracing. I don't know if they're still on Facebook. I think that like the end result of this was that I think that they sort of closed up shop and they've just sort of been like, I don't want the headache. I don't want to get um, hassled about it because I just want to go out and do my thing. So I think at the end of the day, it just turned into sort of like a, um, you know, a a way to sort of push people that were engaged in online communities to just say, like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to dive into it anymore just because it's too much of a, too much drama. I could say that group still exists. Yeah. That Facebook group. Yeah. It's actually, it says redlining again because I'm on it. Yeah. It does. Uh, It was traced for a while and then they just put it to White Mountain National Guidebook. Yeah. And then I think it it, I'm almost positive it's back to red line. Is it hyphenated or just one word? Who knows? I can look it up. <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure it's two words. Um, the woman who runs it now, Rachel, she um, pulled the group uh, a couple months ago, maybe, and um, decided that it was going to be something that they wanted to call redlining again. Basically, there's there's you can read the comments if you want to know like more sure. information about what it says but yeah she basically is the admin on the group now and um, made the deci- made it kind of like a group decision where we all decided to vote on what we wanted the name of the group to be yeah. and the interesting thing is that there's at least two other groups that are on Facebook Southern New Hampshire Redlining and the Madnock trail system calls it redlining Mm -hmm. and neither of those groups were targeted in the i don't know what you would call it um the attack on the term redlining that occurred back in 2020 it was only the white mountain guide that was that was canceled basically for calling it redlining the other two groups were left out of that here's a question are the i don't remember what the maps look like in the guide are the maps are the trails red themselves, or is, are mm-hmm. they different colors? Red. Okay. I mean, that's the answer red. right there. It, it's- I was going to say, redlining, I, one of my friends who lives out in California, I said, I was like, oh, I'm redlining. He goes, ah, oh, that's sweet. We have that too. And I went, well, what, do you, what is it for you? And he was like, oh, it's all of the red lines on the map. It's actually all the county lines. We yeah. call it redlining. And I was like, "Yeah, everybody's got a different meaning. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, to me, I, I mean, certainly no hikers are advocating for like racism or anything like that. Um, and I, I, I'd like to see words that really capture what people are doing and what the what the, the founding source is. And you're telling me that the trails are marked red. I mean, it just seems like the, the proper word, um, despite the history. Um, and I, I can't imagine people being offended by that. I really can't especially this far out. Yeah. Anyway, so we'll be, I mean, we'll be talking about it. You know, I may throw in red line and tracing. I mean, it is, it's, it's, it's a lot of weird drama. Moving there, on. But, um, moving on. So Danielle, why don't you introduce yourself? Um, why don't you give a little bit of background about your hiking and outdoor um, sort of experience as you were a young person and then can you guide well, us through how question. you got into sort of more of the... You're no longer young. Yeah, more, <laughs> more of the hardcore the, hiking stuff. All right. When I was young, um, I'm, I'm from Rhode Island originally, <laughs> so me and my family used to come up here and camp and everything like that. I thought I was a hiker 
Because, you know, you walked out in the woods and you're like, oh, I can hike. This is great. I went to college at Plymouth State, which is up in the White Mountains. And I joined the outdoors group. And I was like, of course, I'm outdoorsy because I walk in the woods. <laughs> and they took us, took us up Welsh Dickey. Didn't know that at the time. I hated it. It was terrible. I hated life. And I said I was never hiking again in my entire life. I did rattlesnake <laughs> and hook uh, in Holderness a yeah. bunch of times, but I didn't consider that hiking because it was like thing. 15 minutes, 20 minutes to the top. Yeah. Um, and then <clears throat> back in 2012, myself and three of my girlfriends were all like, we're bored. We should do something. And they're like, we should hike. I'm like, <laughs> I don't think so, but okay. So we did Mount Major. And um, I died going up it, obviously. And uh, after that, I was like, I need to hike more. That was great. And my roommate at the time, love her to death. She's one of my best friends. We push each other clearly. But I was like, I'm going to go do a 4,000 footer. There's this thing called the 4,000 footers. And she was like, you do know that Mount Major is like 1,200 feet, right? <laughs> like you just died up that. What do you mean you're going to go do this? So obviously I had to prove her wrong. And then uh, I started with Mount Pierce. Um, hated it all the way up. Loved it all the way down. <laughs> um, got no view. And then... After that, like, obviously, my first year, I did seven and uh, failed on Eisenhower because of snow sideways in the beginning of October. Yeah. And then the next year, I was like, I'm going to do them all. So then I, I finished my 48 within 13 months total. And then I was like, I'll wait a little on the 67. And that's kind of, that's where my list issue went. <laughs> so... The, m the more I started hiking, the more gear I got. Like, obviously, I was in cotton with Jansport backpack on my first seven with <laughs> cotton gloves and cotton everything. Thinking about it now, we were like, oh, that wasn't smart. But there was also not as many people on the trails back then. Yeah. Like, I go midweek now. I saw one guy today. I saw 12 people yesterday, midweek. If I went midweek back in 2012, uh, trails wouldn't have been broken. Oh, wouldn't yeah. have seen anybody. Mm -hmm. So kind of just spiraled from there and i i now go every week <laughs> so you ultimately so you graduated from plymouth state and then decided to stay up here um so my parents moved back uh moved to massachusetts when i was in school when i was 20 i moved back home with them my great grand idea was i'm gonna move to ireland and me and my friend were gonna get like an <laughs> irish husband and we're gonna because we saw P.S. I love you. So <laughs> that was our grand idea. Um, my dad said no. And I went, what do you mean? He goes, well, I paid for undergrad. So you can pay me back if, with interest if you want to do that. And I was like, oh, okay. I guess I, well, <laughs> guess I I'm won't do that. I'm curious. <laughs> I'm curious though. So, what is your uh, what's the move to find an Irish husband? Do you just yes, go to I like love you. the Black Rose in Boston and act did you, confused? Did you not or see what, the movie? What do you do? Ah, uh, no. I a, vaguely it's, remember it's, it. It's P.S. I Love You is a movie out in and there was an like they were here. The husband died, and he actually like left all these things for his wife, and then the wife went to Ireland, met his best friend, ended up marrying him. The guy oh. who had died was Irish. Gerard Br oh, Butler. Okay. Oh, okay. Or he man, played his man crush right yeah. there. So oh. therefore, we're like, this is going to be great. We're going to go and be like waitresses, and we'll just find a guy, and the, we'll be it'll be great because that was you know twenty one year old brain. <laughs> oh, that's wild. <laughs> yeah. Instead, you find a short king from Manchester. Uh, I'm single, so I have nothing from Manchester. <laughs> so, but no, I went back home. I ended awesome. up going to grad school in Boston. I went to Suffolk. And then two weeks after that, moved to Manchester. And I've been there for the last 14 years. Huh. Okay. Wow. And um, as far as your evolution on hiking, so you hit some snow in October in those early uh -huh. days. Did you did you like do the winter hiking thing right away? Or did you uh, take take a, like a year or two to learn to do that? Or how, how did that evolve? So I did... Like I stopped after, like we failed on Eisenhower, me and my friend Adam, who had gone out with me for those few hikes. We went and did Musilak. It was cold, but not enough snow. It was just freezing. And then I started hiking in March, like two days after winter ended. Um, and that's when I learned how to snowshoe by myself in the woods. Because <laughs> my mom was like, hey, you, got, you need snowshoes? And I was like, yeah. So she gave me ones with crampons, but they didn't have televators back then. Mm -hmm. um, that's when I learned what poles were. 
Um, and I went out and did my first solo hike to Wombeck, not knowing I was breaking trail the whole time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Can you explain what a televator is? Televator is what you put under your heel. You can flip up. Yeah. So when you walk uphill, it's not like you're using all of like your Achilles and your calves don't get yeah. stretched. It's almost like you're on stairs. Yeah, like the They're cog. Like high heels. The cog approach. The cog railroad yes. for snowshoes. Yep. So cool. that, it, I kind of just went into it and like I, I Googled everything. And uh, back then I used uh, 4000footers.com. Um the website i think it's still up um mm. one of my friends I, f- I became her friend she's the one who actually created the site but i used to like um i used to like go on there and be like what's the easiest route i bought all the books i bought the guidebook i bought the four thousand footer book i, I bought <clears throat> maps um back then it wasn't like watch youtube videos it was just hey read up on things i used to check everything i would check the weather i would check um New, I don't think I checked New England trail conditions that time. It used to be just the New Hampshire trails. Yeah. And just research everything. Because I went about half solo and half not. So. Mm. What do you think flipped, What what's flipped in you where you went from, I hate this Welsh dicky to, I kind of like this Mount Major to, I'm going to do the 4,000 footer list. What, what, what do you think in your... Was it your personality just changing? Was it your life situation changing? What what was it that sort of flipped that switch for you? Um, I guess more of, it was a good workout. I really hate going to the gym. And it was something like, hey, it gets you outside. You get to see stuff. Even if there's no views, you get to you still kind of see stuff. And back then, I didn't know that I would just pretty much meet everybody that I now <laughs> hang out with from hiking. <laughs> back then, I didn't know anybody that hiked. So like my 4,000 footer finish, my, one of my best friends came on and she had sneakers on and I gave her a pole to come down Kerrigan. (laughs) So like it's, it just kind of kept building. It was a more goal oriented kind of gave me like a, I guess not purpose, but like, Hey, see if you can do this. Hey, see if you can do this. Hey, can you do it faster now? Hey, (laughs) that's awesome. Just kept building. Yeah, and at a certain point, you started getting into backpacking, mm-hmm. and you've you've I know that you've uh, every year you go on like a long uh, section hike for the AT. So, can you talk a little bit about uh, how that started and where you're at with the AT section hike? Um, yeah, so the reason why I started section hiking was my friend Trish and Alex mm-hmm. were going on the AT, and I was like, "That is awesome!" Like when I was hiking, I didn't I knew the AT existed, but like didn't think about it that thoroughly like i did Mm. the 67 i was like oh those are through hikers like not thinking anything of it and then um myself my friend suzanne and ed we all were like hey we're gonna meet you guys in uh, august wherever Mm -hmm. you guys are we're gonna find you we're gonna meet you and we're gonna hike with you if we can keep up cool if we can't we're gonna hug you and say bye but still go out (laughs) so that's kind of how that started um we went out and we met them in pennsylvania Mm. anybody knows about at in pennsylvania it's terrible really it's called roxylvania and uh huh. like it's just terrible <laughs> Interesting. it's like the northern part of pennsylvania but um after that kind of just got hooked and my um ed was he jumped off trail there from the previous year he had hiked half the trail jumped off right where we jumped on yep. and then suzanne and i hadn't done anything so we kind of we all started doing sections like a week at a time and every time we would do it, they're like, can we do more? And I'm like, I don't know if I want to do more. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and then they would talk me into like merging into the middle. And then, um, the last few years, myself and Suzanne have added a Southern trip too. Mm-hmm. So we were going northbound from that PA part. And then myself and Suzanne jumped down to Georgia, the start of the trail and kind of have like two sections kind of going now. Wow. So, yeah, I actually, until you had mentioned it, I had forgotten, but when I was on Katahdin, I had actually met up with Trish and Alex on the night they finished, or the day they I finished. So they had come down into <laughs> A-Ball, sure. and we had we yeah, all hung that, out. That's so. actually how they, because I messaged them, and I was like, when are you guys finishing? And it was the, what was that called? The Northeast Backpacking Group, or something like that? Yeah, yeah. So they were telling yeah. me when they were finishing, I'm like, you think I'm going to be able to get into Baxter on Columbus Day weekend? What do you you think? Mm-hmm. There's sites available, and then I was like, "Wait a second, there's already sites taken 
for the group, and I knew everybody. And so you just told drop their name or something, or no? It was Phil, right? Phil and um, yeah, Phil, Phil and, and Pat, Pat were the ones who did oh, it. And gotcha. I knew them, so mm-hmm. I was like, "Hey, you guys still have room?" And they're like, "Yeah," and I was oh, like, "Sweet!" So I jumped in. And then I told the girls, I'm like, I'm going to park my car down at Katahdin Streams. When you jump in my car, drive to A-Ball, come camp with us. We'll give you food. I'll give you a different backpack. I'll give you blankets and sweats and whatever you want and sweets. And then we drove my car back. Um, no, we got a ride in the morning to Katahdin Streams. We finished, came down to A-Ball, and my car was there, and then I drove them out. So... Oh, I used to, I didn't wow. even remember you. I was you there, there the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, Sorry. no, I fin- I went on to the top with them. I got them um, oh. that good old viewless summit at that time. Yeah, wow, nice. Well, in your opinion, so when you think about the AT, what is what's your thoughts about that, like Georgia section down there? Because I'm interested in doing that in the future. Beautiful. It was really, really? cool. It's kind of it's weird because there's, there's four thousand footers in Georgia, like Blood Mountain. Um, it's it's different. It's for sure different. Like I remember going down there and we were just like, "Huh, there's woods in Georgia." That doesn't like it, you just don't expect it. Um, and I will mm. give it that if you tell people down there cuz they're all they all just started. A lot of them have just started. Yeah. Um, but if you go down there during I don't know, February through May, we went down there in May and uh, we still had some people and they were all like, "You're you're from New Hampshire?" how are the whites like they're all like <laughs> awed by us we're like oh like they're f- they're fine like they're <laughs> cool like it's cool down here too though like take everything in yeah. and they were just very like everybody mm-hmm. seems to be scared of the whites so yeah, sure um like we're we're just over i've got like 1100 miles now in on the at so i'm just over halfway yep it's really funny. Where are you where are you gonna land um when you pick it up again? For this coming year. Um yeah, we yeah. jumped out at Hi- uh, Grayson Highlands in Virginia, um, where the ponies are. So we jumped out there. We jumped out a little early this time because it was raining and it was like forty degrees and miserable. And section hiking life means that you don't have to be miserable if you don't want to. You can just go home a half a day early and get a shower. It's kind of what we've learned. Um, so we'll jump on there. I don't know if uh, myself and Suzanne have been talking. I don't know if we'll be able to get one or two weeks in. Yep. If we can get 200 miles. I, I, I did map it out. Uh, 200 miles is like 13 days and it jumps us right below McAfee Knob. So. Sheesh. So ultimately, so you can get your iconic picture and then move it on. It wouldn't get us yeah. there yet, <laughs> but we would be able to start oh, next wouldn't. year's right at that. So you're a list junkie, though, huh? Super, super list junkie. <laughs> you and I tackled some 500s together. Yeah. That's been fun. I'm still, I'm still working on that one. Oh my god, real, I, I, I'm real assuming. Slowly. Yeah, me too. Me too. All my other lists, I, I have priority lists. <laughs> That's you have to prioritize them. I can imagine. You'll never finish them all, yeah. <laughs> or you will, but it'll be like all at the same time. Oh, can you imagine lining that up? My and friend it- did that. My friend Joe finished his uh, 48, mm-hmm. winter winter 48, yeah. uh, 67, and New England 100 highest because he saved Mariah <sighs> in Holy, the winter. That's epic, huh, Mike? <laughs> yeah, that's impressive. Wow. That's impressive. Um, you know what I wanted to, and we got to get to Rebecca too, but I wanted to just ask you one more thing. So you had taken the trip to Yosemite with a crew this year. Matter of fact, it was helpful because I could look at your pictures and sort of analyze where I was going to be going. Cause I went about a month after you guys. Um, can you talk a little bit about your perspective on Yosemite and then talk a little bit about like, have you done any other national park trips that you, that, that stand out to you? Um, Yosemite was cool. Uh, but so I've done Yosemite, I've done um, Glacier, Tetons, and Yellowstone, um, and I went to Rainier as well. I will say, as much as I love those areas, national parks are so swamped. There's so many people everywhere. Um, I know when we hit Yosemite border, because we were hiking the JMT, um, the John Muir Trail, it like there was nobody because it's so far out. But once you started getting into closer mm-hmm. on roads, you just started seeing lots and lots of people, lots of day hikers. It's almost like you're seeing Mount Washington on top. People drove there. Um, but it was, it is <laughs> epic though there. Like it's, you look out and like you, you did half dome this time, right, Mike? 
Yeah, yeah. And I think my my biggest thing about Half Dome was it was just so freaky going up those cables because you had no idea of the skill level of the oh, people yeah. that were above you or <laughs> below you. So I've done it twice now because I did the JMT last year and this year I did half of it. And I, I got Yosemite uh, Half Dome permits for both years. Um, mm. Doing it in the morning, I will give it, definitely was nice because you you didn't have that many people coming. Like when you started coming down, there wasn't people like massive amounts of people, a line going up. Um, and of course, when I got to it last year, I had 200 miles on a set of shoes that were already pretty worn down. And I was like, I'm a slide. I'm a slide all the way down this thing. <laughs> it was great. So, How would you rate Teton versus uh, Yosemite? Cause um, that's, that's on my radar from the next so- trip. I was with the boyfriend I had at the time. We did a Glacier uh, Yellowstone Teton all in one trip in 12 days. Um, and Tetons is more backpacking, I would say. Like not as many day hikes. We went on day hikes, but they were very, very short. Like I spent a day and a half in the Tetons. Mm-hmm. I spent, what's it, nine days in Glacier. <laughs> um, I loved Glacier. Glacier was beautiful. Tetons was cool, but we also had the fires. So I didn't know the mountains were there until you got there and you're like oh oh they're right here so it was very uh it was different i know i know dolores has been out onto the tetons and she's backpacked out there um and she had a little altitude wheezy i believe she said when she was like "Ah, i didn't feel right and like when you were in yosemite it wasn't that high as much it is it was high compared to us um, once you get up to that 10,000 feet, you really start feeling it. And I know the Tetons are up yeah, there yeah. for the, any of the backpacking areas. So right. I like, I would say I like Yosemite just because I've backpacked more in Yosemite. Um, yeah, yeah. And I, I agree with you about Yosemite. Like we were in Mono Meadow and like it was the first two days we didn't see anybody. And then once we got into like little uh-huh. Yosemite and by Half Dome and that area there, it was, it was very right. crowded coming down the Mist Trail. Uh, but I was okay with it. You know, I kind of expected yeah. that. But yeah, you're right. It is, it is, it's a scene. <laughs> it is. And we had to, I was going to say this sure. year when we came out, it was uh, making sure Dolores got down safely. <laughs> Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I want to get her on the show someday, <laughs> so I'm going to I'm going to hold that story. But you guys had a you guys had a little bit of a rescue there. But I'm going to try to get her on the show at some point. So um, we'll we'll do a deep dive on that. But uh, just sit tight, Danielle. I'm going to come back to you. But Rebecca, I just want to um, come come to you for a second and reintroduce yourself. So you've been on the show a couple times, and I know that like when we initially talked, you were sort of talking about your sort of your medical journey and and your goals of you know, attempting a red line in like a single year. And then that got put on hold due to your medical challenges, but you're sort of back and relatively healthy. You want to reintroduce yourself and sort of talk about what you've been up to. And uh, you've got a new sort of hiking platform that uh, I want to, I want to hear about too. Sure. So in 2020, I was at about 23% redlined and decided I wanted to try doing it in a year. So I zeroed out my spreadsheet and started over at zero. Um, I got 7.4% done in about two months, and then COVID hit, so I had to stop. Started again in August of 2020, or June of 2020, and um, got till August of 2020, 18% done, and then had to stop again because I got diagnosed with cancer. I went through cancer treatment for 19 months, and my last... Day, seeing my oncologist and being discharged from treatment um, was in March of 2023. Um, at, up to that point, I had continued working on redlining, um, and I was about 56 or 7 percent done for my whole life because I kind of just kept my data. Obviously, every time I reset my spreadsheet, I would still keep a copy of you know what I had done, um, and then. In June of 2022, I don't know if I just said March of 2023, I ended treatment. If not, if I did, what I meant was March of 2022. <laughs> I My calendar is a little messed up because I've been hiking so much that I like lose track of, I yeah. honestly have lost like a few years of my life, sort of, in my head. Um, so anyways, so June of 2022, I started redlining again, and my goal, hold on. was to do it in 15 months. 
So I, and I was also going to do the 100 highest. So I had set aside this time as kind of a gift to myself for going through cancer treatment. And I was working part-time, but also I was mostly hiking. So I hiked about three to four days a week. So from June 19th, 2022 until October 29th, 2023, I did 97.6% of the trails. I had four hikes left to complete a timed attempt. And at that point, I actually finished the guidebook in its totality because I had that extra 56% I had already done. So I was redoing a Mm -hmm. lot of trails throughout this 16, or it ended up being 16 months. So I... um, I finished on Franconia Brook Trail on October 29th, and I decided it would be very anticlimactic to keep going and do the four remaining days of hiking, and decided Mm -hmm. I'm done. And also, at that point, I was more than burnt out and needed to get back to, like, being an adult because I have a household. Like, I can't just step away from all of that forever. Um, Mm -hmm. So, I decided it was where I needed to end this journey, and I ended it that day. Uh, And since then, I have gone on a few hikes, but I've mainly been working and working on building a website that is kind of a little bit of what I want to work on after, like now that I'm done. Um, It certainly isn't the only thing I want to do with my time or my life, but it's one thing that I've wanted to do for a long time. So I'm finally taking the time to do it. Yeah. And what's the rebranding? So you've had a couple of iterations of different social well, media personas. So my name is Sockton Hikes on Instagram. That's my personal Instagram. So that still mm-hmm. is what it is. I I have no change to that. That's just my personal Instagram that I post on. But um, yeah. I have had a website since 2020 that I've always just kept as like a blog. And it was RebeccaSperry.com. And I... I've mentioned, because I write for a few different outdoor brands, I've mentioned to them that it would be really interesting and something that they should think about is targeting the day hiker um, population because most of these websites Mm -hmm. tend to target through hikers, at least the the ones I've written for. And none of them really took me up on the idea. So I'm like, well, why am I like giving them an idea and just assuming I'm not good enough to do it myself, sort of? So I decided I'm going to do it myself. And that's essentially where I I decided to, I took my personal blog website and renamed it the NewEnglandHiker.com. And it is geared towards um, mostly, I would say, day hikers in the New England area looking for advice on um, everything from gear to different routes to try to um, just hiking basics and things like that because uh i'm certainly not a ultra athlete and i could see myself as a person who isn't an ultra athlete being intimidated to approach someone who is perhaps an ultra athlete for advice on on routes and things like that so and since i've hiked every trail in the guidebook i feel like i have now finally gotten to a point where i i'm worthy of presenting my information for the public like, I'm not just some influencer who's posting funny v- videos on my social media. Like, I actually have kind of, like, something to back my information. Yeah, you got a re- you got Yeah, a like, I've done the trails in the guidebook now one over one and a half times. I'm working on round two. Mm-hmm. And my goal is to finish round two, at least. So, I don't think I'm a complete moron at this point. I think it's a little bit valid for me to present information to the public. So, basically, right now, I'm just trying to build content on the site and um, post every week. And I also have a master's in fine arts to finish, which is a whole other thing that I need to start doing again. (laughs) Um, So, I'm pretty busy. I have a lot going on right now. And I've been on a few hikes, but mainly I've been enjoying not hiking as much and i love that i get to just sit back in my nice warm house and watch as danielle's out there breaking trail and know that i don't have to join her (laughs) nice yeah do you uh as far as like the format of the new england hiker so i've gotten a few videos that i've that have popped up on my social Mm -hmm. media so it seems like you're 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 
you're segmenting out some of the videos by the the redlining tab. So you'd be yeah. like the Waterville Valley area. It's got a, you know x number of miles, x number mm-hmm. of trails. Um, is that how you're going to approach it, or are you still sort well, of feeling it out and trying to figure out what the format's going to be? So I write a post on the website, and I have a whole outline all the way through May of what I'm posting once a week on the website. And each post, I'm mm-hmm. breaking into about five reels on Instagram, just so I have something every day to post. But it's depending on the content. So, like, I was doing, I did the first three tabs in the guidebook because I was just like, what do I put on this website? How about I start with this? I started with that. And I did one, I did three different tabs in the guidebook. So, like, the Kerrigan area and the moats. Um, I did the Chikora and East Sandwich. And then I did uh, Waterville Valley and Regular Sandwich. Those were the three areas I've covered so far. Um, in my on my website so if you go and you look you'll see there's a post on each of those areas breaking them down and then this week I'm focusing on um, holiday ideas for people but specifically local stuff so I went online and researched and I pulled Instagram for local brands so what are some New England based brands in five categories and then I wrote up a post with all of them I have them all t- like a uh, what they offer and like their hand like a uh, link to their website and then next week I'm going to do winter hiking here like every week I'm doing a different post um, but I did start with the red lining simply just because I didn't know what else to start with and I needed to get some content it's cool Got it. So I'll link this in the uh, the show notes here so you can go on to the New England hiker website and then you're uh, you exist on what youtube instagram TikTok? I use mostly just instagram i do have a tiktok i don't have youtube um but the tiktok okay. it's like they're all the new england hiker anything that if it's that that's my handle and i am gonna do like okay. another idea that I, I have a bunch of ideas but i can't roll it all out at once because it's a lot um i want to put up gpx tracks and um routes that are developed already because i have the gpx tracks for a bajillion different hikes but i'm going to have those mm-hmm. behind a subscriber paywall because i i'm going to try and make money off of this and there's only so many ways mm-hmm. to make money off of a website and then the other thing is i'd like to i, I didn't originally think i was going to do this but somebody instantly wanted stickers <laughs> so i might do stickers or something like that at some point um but yeah it's mostly uh it's just another thing that I, I'm working on. I have so many things going on. It's not even funny. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And then when we, I think when we first talked to you, you were in like a, you know, I think you were in the middle of sort of the medical issues and the challenges. You were kind of coming out of it, but I think it was still sort of weighing deeply on you. Do you and if you don't want to talk about this, just tell me to shut up. But um, where are you at as far as, a, are you just sort of at the point where you're living your life and you're not worried? I mean, you obviously you got to worry about it. Uh, you know, it's always there, but where are you at as far as medically and, and, and emotionally when it comes to sort of where you're, you know, where you've been? So, um, I have, so you're always at risk. And because I stopped treatment, I didn't finish my treatment. I am a, doubled my risk of recurrence. So, um, mm-hmm. I had a, I am at a higher risk of recurrence. Um, you are so, you see your oncologist usually every six months. So I last saw my oncologist in January and I had, (laughs) this is the fun part of being in uh, medical stuff. So I have this appointment with this person and uh, um, meet with her, talk about hiking and she takes like my blood pressure, silly stuff like that, does like a little bit of a physical exam. And then I get a $524 bill. And I, so I fired my oncologist basically after that appointment and have yet to return because I am not paying $500 for you to ask me about my hiking and take my blood pressure. (laughs) So expensive. Um, Yeah. It is the most ridiculous thing you've ever seen in your entire life. So I have a surgeon that I still see and I'm still, I have to get for the rest of my life. I will be getting six month scans. Um, and, and so I go in in January, I think to get my MRI, I had a, um, flag on my last MRI so I had a biopsy last February to make sure I didn't have cancer again Um, but basically it's always there there's never not a risk I just have uh, it's like once you have cancer you have cancer you never get to step out of that world you just have to 
you don't know what's going on in your body, but you assume you're okay. That's why you don't ever, you'll never say, oh, she's cured. You say there's no evidence of disease because you don't know. You can't see a cancer cell. Um, so basically, I saw my I saw my surgeon in September, I think, for my mammogram, and it was okay. And then I have to go in again in, I think it's February, for my MRI, and then I go back again in six months. It's like forever. Do you find when you're doing the red line, so, so I mean, I think you and Danielle definitely hiked together before. I've seen a few, few um, posts and things like that. But I think for the most part, you guys are kind of going solo. And Danielle, you can jump in on this too. But Rebecca, specifically, like you're solo, you're out there hiking. Like I know I do a lot of solo hiking too, and I think a lot. A lot of my thoughts are around work and family and things like that. But it, like you definitely get inside your own head. Do you find that like the hiking solo and the thinking about things like is it is it therapeutic for you or do you sometimes just sort of dwell on things that you shouldn't be focusing on as much um i listen to a lot of podcasts and music and honestly um it's very therapeutic for me and i don't tend to get i'm not i'm not gonna go out into the woods and like work myself up and be like, oh my gosh, well, maybe I have this thing that's happening. It's actually a lot less of that there than in the real world. Like, my back's been bothering me the last few weeks, and I'm gonna, I, my instant thought was, I have bone mets. Like, I have cancer in my bones. And it's like, not just a little, oh, that's, it's not like the way you would think about it. It's like a legitimate fear, because I have friends who have bone mets that had my cancer. And like, I have to talk myself out of calling my doctor and honestly, I'll be completely honest. I should know better than to do this, but I don't want to know. I don't want to know yeah. if I have it. Because it's like, even knowing that the worst thing you can do is not know, I don't want to know because it's terrifying. Um, so I actually spiral a lot more in the real world than out in the woods. Danielle, what about, yeah, so I, I can imagine like, um, for me personally, Rebecca, I I feel like I just put everything aside and I'm in the woods and I'm happy. But Danielle, what about you? Do you do you think about like work and life or do you pretty much just chill in the woods? Um, when soloing? Um, yeah. Yeah, everything. <laughs> I, I think about everything. I, I go solo more or less because I figured out what I wanted to do an hour before I got there. Um, or it, it's, it's, Sometimes it's easier going solo, being like, oh, I only have to go my pace. I can push myself. I can do this. But I do think about, like, I think about everything, but I don't, I don't try to dwell because you do, like, redlining kind of got you, got me to the, hey, it doesn't matter about the peak. doesn't matter about the view. It's the trail. Hey, you're out on trail. You're, uh, you're usually around like-minded people. Like, it's very rare that I've met somebody on trail and they're like, mad and angry usually like oh hey how are you talk about the most random yeah. things ever um so it kind of it's it shows also like the the better of humanity <laughs> out on trails so yeah. it's in compared to like work wise like it's the opposite of work i can go out there and just be a hiker and enjoy yeah, and do you when when you talk about planning, Danielle? Do you and I? I see you post sometimes. You'll be like head north, not sure where. Do you literally <laughs> just make a decision as you're driving, or do uh, you yep. have a little bit more planning than that? Um, so because I have all of my different lists, <laughs> I always have options. So at the moment, I have grid, um, and then I have four k a day, which is hiking any four thousand footer in the northeast on a certain calendar day. Um, and then I have the New Hampshire 500, um, the highest 500 in New Hampshire. Um, I think that's the main three left <laughs> that I have because I've kind of, I finished five lists this year. Um, so I won't be finishing anything for quite a while, but I, I have an idea. So like this month I only need eight more peaks. So those are the peaks I want to get, but if I can't, I will still just get out just cause I, I know I need to. And like I'm going to Baxter in the beginning of January and we're trying to go for Katahdin again in the winter. So now 
all my brain is train for Katahdin. You want you're in snowshoes. You're going to be going 16 miles into Chimney Pond. I need to train. <laughs> so no this kidding. is now like training mode. Um, and then I have to s- ski because it's winter because <laughs> I'm going to California at the end of January. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I need to jump oh, in real quick. Then, Danielle, you, you left yeah. off the most important list. <laughs> what is it called? Oh, Scoops and Loops. Thank you. <laughs> what oh. is that? So there's views, and, there's views and Brews. <laughs> Have you heard of that one? <laughs> oh, no. I, I, I sadly know a lot of lists. So Views and Brews, I actually finished at Reckless. Um, nice. Right when they opened. Um, but there's also Scoops and Loops. Both have the same idea. So Views and Brews, it has to be a brew pub. has to have food. Right. Um, scoops has to be a new... Is it, it's like ice cream. homemade ice cream of that place. Um, <laughs> so you have to hike one mile 24 hours before or after visiting this place. And you have to do so many in each. And there's a patch because there's always of a course. patch. That's so cool. Wait, so this is a yes. real thing? <laughs> I have the Views and Brews scoops patch. And I haven't finished my Scoops and Loops yet. How have I done this much hiking and I've never heard of you? Rebecca, why have you told me about Scoops these? Scoops and Loops is hands down the best patch and it is the patch that I want more than anything else. Because it's ice oh cream. Scoops and I need Loops. To look this up. <laughs> well, and Rebecca, what do you do for planning? Like, I feel like you're more like... So if I'm understanding this, Danielle, so essentially you've got like these four or five different lists and like the grid right now is primary for you before it was red line. So you sort of just look and say like, okay, here's my options and pick an option. Rebecca, I feel like you were more, I don't want to say scientific, but like you had like a plan for your red line. But I feel like that, I, I'm guessing that probably all fell apart and you just, at the end, it was just like, you know, I got, I got, I got to pick through my certain list. But how, how do you do your planning? Well, it's hard for me to do. So that whole situation was extremely planned. It had to be in order to get them done in a set amount of time, especially because of the weather window being what it is up here. So like, I feel like that almost shouldn't even, it's like a moot point unless you're planning on doing it in a set amount of time. I was extremely planned for that. I had to be. Um, But in general, um, okay, like, I will say, oh, I feel like doing this, and I'll go do it the next morning. But I don't typically, I'm more like, um, not quite to the point of like, I'm going to drive and figure it out as I'm driving, but I don't plan ahead for for a hike if it's just like me having fun in the woods. It's more like, well, what kind of mood am I in? So like, oh, I kind of feel like doing an easier hike today, or I feel like going and just walking in the woods, or I feel like doing this or that. Like, I don't... um, if I'm hiking and it's not because I'm working on a ridiculous goal, I just do what I feel like doing. Um, but I don't. I I won't get in the car and drive and plan it as I'm doing that. Unlike me, <laughs> like Danielle, she's definitely a little bit. She's she's a little bit. I'm pretty neurotic. I'm a very Type A personality. Like if I could plan out every yeah, moment yeah. of my day and every moment of my life, I would. And uh, yeah, it's. I'm very much that person. (laughs) Yeah, I relate to that. I relate to that. Um, This question for either one of you can answer this, but like, I feel like, and again, I haven't done, I don't know, last time I checked the red line, I was was close to 50%, maybe somewhere around that area, but I do feel like I've done enough hiking where when I look at an area like um, the Northern Presidentials versus like, Cabot Wombach versus the Sandwich Range versus um, the Pemi. Like I feel like those different areas and those different wilderness sections have their own personalities. The way you know the types of trees and the way that you know even the way the trees are spread out amongst each other, the the rocks and the roots and the volume and everything like that and the rivers. Do you guys get that same vibe? Like you must feel it even more acutely than I do around. You know, I feel like we could sort of blindfold you, drop you into a wilderness section in the whites, and you would kind of know where you are. Like, do you get that attuned to it? Interesting. I would say yes, for sure. Like, I would say, I know that you think that I didn't plan for redlining, but I definitely had my last 30 hikes planned out, and I would just pick Okay. (laughs) which one I needed to do. But every area is the same. It's the same. Well, every area is different. Like, the dry river is its own beast. 
the the northern prezies is mm-hmm. its own beast. The Randolph part is completely different than, you know, the the Cog side or the Tuckerman side. Everything's everything's a little different, but it's cool because once you do it all, you're like, ha. I know of every cool secret ever. I can go back there and I can camp here and I know where the water is because I had to go there and I know where the campsites are. <laughs> That's like the the luxury of actually finishing it now. I'm like, I know where all the cool places are. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. That would be like an amazing game show is to take like <laughs> 10 or 12 hikers that have re- you know completed the red line and sort of drop them into areas without telling them where they are and then like try to get guess where you are what what part of the wilderness i like to look at other people's instagram stories and try to guess where they are based on their video without knowing yeah me too and I do that yeah. a lot yep. it's yeah. good it keeps it fresh yeah yeah absolutely yeah. um couple of gear questions for you guys so how has your gear evolved over the years and what is your advice for people that sort of are just starting off hiking and you know where should they focus is it on the backpack is it on the um the clothing is it on the um you know the safety gear what what is your opinions about gear i say rebecca you want to go first and i'll go after you sure uh so i would say that and we're talking day hiking i'm assuming um, yeah. Well, the most important things are going to be things like your shoes. You definitely want to have shoes that are comfortable and do not be that person who's out there in flip flops or some kind of sand. Well, OK, there are the sandal hikers, but more than likely, if you're brand new to hiking, you're not going to be one of those people who hikes. Uh, what are those things? Chacos? Chacos. You're probably not a yes. Chaco hiker if you're brand new to hiking. Um, so some kind of proper footwear is really important. And Honestly, I would say that most hikers, it's better to be in a trail runner than a, a boot. Um, I have I have chronic plantar fasciitis, and I cannot wear anything that goes above my ankle because it's going to cause my my Achilles to be too tight, and then I get like a flare up. So, um, you you need to know your body and you need to be able to pick proper footwear and definitely a backpack that fits properly. I was pro- I was improperly fitted for my first real backpack and it ended up causing me to get a cyst on my spine that caused me to have foot drop and it pinched my sciatic nerve. It was a whole nightmare. So make sure you're getting properly fitted and that you're getting a pack a pack that fits well on you. Um I would say those are like the two biggest oh, things because I mean, honestly like yeah you shouldn't hike in cotton and you shouldn't hike in like sweatpants and things like that but you're not gonna be like those those items i think you kind of pick up along the way and same with like safety stuff i mean please don't just go out there with a 16 ounce water bottle in your hands and no backpack and hike mount washington like i've seen so many people do it's just I, I think that we're in night a lot of there's a lot of naivety and because they don't know any better, they're not knowing what they're doing is dangerous and putting other people's lives at risk. So many times I see people that I'm like, you do realize that if they have to do a rescue, it's gonna take what, fifteen, twenty people mm-hmm. what, five hours at least to go rescue you. Um but I definitely think the most important things are gonna be your footwear and your backpack, at least in my opinion. Danielle, your thoughts? Um, from starting to now, yeah. um, I went with, obviously, what I had available. My backpack was not fitted. I bought it online. Um, it, it was a Gregory, <laughs> and it seemed awesome, and I still have it, but um, it was kind of just trial and error is yeah. how I went. I had Wolverine boots, big clunkers from Bob's store, which were the grippiest things I've ever had in my life. Super cool. But um, I now wear ultra superior running shoes. Um they're trail runners. I do not trail run. I am a klutz, so I fall and I trip and I bruise things. So, um, But over the years, I've found trail <laughs> runners, as much as I go through them, they're more comfortable. They're lighter. You can walk through water and they dry out. Um, safety gear, I've done the over the years. Like I've gone soloing. Should I have stuff back then? Yep. Do I have different things now? I have an inReach. I have uh, a satellite, was it the GPS locator beacon? 
I have the, PLB. Yeah, I have that one. Um, but that I always carry that one in the winter. In reach, I got only because I started soloing when I was in Glacier. And there's things that can kill you in the woods there. Yeah. <laughs> Compared to here, I came back home and I was like, ah, black bears, they're nothing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Grizzlies out there will kill you. Um, no kidding. So it's just kind of, you gotta, it's trial and error is how I had gone over the years. Like just even my layering system what i had even insulated boots from winter when i started i used to do my regular boots with a toe warmer on top and on the bottom i now have insulated boots um it's but i know that rebecca she does trail runners almost all year but it's everybody sweats different everybody does different and yeah just be smart look up weather and uh you know always have a map and for, first aid kits have always changed for me. I used mm-hmm. to have a really big one. I went to a really small one to then whoever gets into different accidents over the years, you keep adding. So, you know, now I have gauze that can wrap around heads. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it, it is a lot of trial and error. That's hilarious. I, I feel like I've added, like, I've slowly added, like, different band-aids to my first aids kit, first aid kit, and now I look the other day, and I was like, why do I have 97 band-aids in my first aid kit? I need to, yep. like, get those out of there. I actually have a, uh, a question for Stomp. Um, oh. So, I've noticed recently there's been a lot of back and forth in the Facebook pages comment section about not carrying a map because if you're on a summit and it's windy it's not going to help you to get out your map because it's going to get blown away or blown around and it's better to use a gps like some kind of uh, all trail type app i'm just curious what your plot what your thoughts on it is yeah and don't use all trails (laughs) also just like danielle just said i know yeah i i'm definitely adverse to all trails for sure but you Definitely need a map. I mean, you can always get off uh, below tree line or just cower behind a rock to pull a map out at all times because you, if you're relying upon electronic devices, you have that risk of them shutting down on you, running out of batteries. So it's always good to have a map, a compass, um, especially in low visibility or white out conditions. They can save your life for sure. I mean, from a bushwhacking perspective. As long as you know how to use a map if you don't know <laughs> where course. you are. So if you're in the middle of the woods and you don't know which way is north. Yeah. Um, oh, they go together. No question as about it. As long as you can it. read one, you yeah. know, the topo lines. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I I will always have a map. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I also think, like, honestly, like, having a map in those high wind conditions on the summit is probably a good thing because it's sort of like a kick in the ass. Like I would rather pull my map out and have it, the wind blow it away and remind me, Oh, Oh darn. I need to make sure that I'm like keeping an eye on things versus, um, pulling out like my, my gloves or a jacket or something like that and having that get whipped away. So I do think that, you know, the worst case scenario is, is your map gets blown away and it's sort of a reminder to say like, Hey, hold on to all your other stuff while you're up there if you're putting on gear. So yeah. it's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a better thing to lose than it would be like gloves or hats or a jacket or something like that. For sure. Yeah. You should have the map, which is fundamental to hike safe. You should screenshot your route. I generally will have, you know, Cal Tovo or one of these apps that, will give you an image with north at the top. So I screenshot them. So that's in my phone and you can expand them and shrink them as you need to. And then I also generally, if if I'm bushwhacking, if I'm on trail, I I will not go half as far as this, but if I'm bushwhacking, I have a hardened uh, Garmin GPS unit that's built for harder weather and whatnot. And uh, those three things should serve you well. Thank you, Stomp. Thank you. <laughs> well, the other reminder I think of is in, in this cold weather, um, I always used to, I, I break out two hand warmers and just have those in my pocket with my with my phone. Oh, no doubt. Just to I limit don't. that. Not that I rely on my phone that much, but it's just, it's one other sort of safety device to keep your phone a little bit warm. Sure, there's, sure. There's a thing called Fousey. Yeah. It's called a phone koozie. 
It's called Fousey. That's what I use. I don't actually put warmers in them, and they, it. You've had that forever. Like hangs right here. Yeah, I, yeah. It, it's probably my third one because the f- bigger the phones, <laughs> the bigger case I need. But it, oh it's God. it's like NASA stuff. Like so I'm it's learning actually, so much. It's Scoops and loops, keep... Fousies. <laughs> yeah, I oh, love Fousey just because like so like today it was six out when I started. My my phone had probably. 92 percent when i finished my hike and i track yeah i tracked it i took videos i i took pictures i looked at my track uh-huh so, i'm ordering one right one. now <laughs> hey i have a question for you both um i don't know if this applies to either of you or not but the 31st edition of the white mountain guide came out in 2022 hmm. 30th came out just before that and it's been out for quite a while did you have to really like revamp your plans or did you have to add trails or spurs or anything? Did anything dramatic change when the 31st came out? I finished the 31st. I think we're back. You did the 30th. Yeah. So I randomly, I, I knew the 31st was coming out and I wasn't going to finish in time yeah. for the, like you can do any guidebook. <clears throat> okay. You don't have to do the current one. You could do the 76th year guidebook. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. So you're redlining or tracing uh, whatever guidebook you want. Oh, so, so they keep I, you coming back for more. <laughs> I, I ended up <laughs> right. randomly seeing new trails over the years and been like, I'm going to need this one year. And so I'm uh, going to need this later. So I would go down them and I probably added like, so I looked when they actually added it last year and I only had like two or three that I actually needed to add on because I had already done them. Okay. That was how, how I worked. But I know she obviously made her plans last year for the 30th and. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Rebecca, any comments on that? Yeah. So um, I have about, so what, so I'm working on the 31st edition now. So, um, okay. like I already did Mad River Path, which was in the new guidebook. And I believe that's a new one. So I did that one towards the 31st edition just because I just threw it on one day when I was hiking in that area. Um, but I'm trying to, I don't know what else is new. I can't remember off the top of my head. Oh, I know there's some up in the Coos, the Coos Trail area. Right, Danielle? Is that the one that's, uh, that we talked about that was like a two, oh. 2.7 mile extra bonus fun time that we get to go do? That one's still not a... Is that in a the gray, guide? grade area. Oh, it is? Okay. So there's No, a- it's not a great area. Oh, it's not? Okay. Sangu- sanguinary, I can never say. It. Yeah. It's right across from uh, Table Rock in Dixville. It's on the Coas. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. uh, well, yeah, it's, it's, I don't, that one's it's like controversial. A gr- yeah, it's a controversial opinion. one. <laughs> really? Uh, <laughs> it's a controversial trail. Well, because they decided to huh. add a 2.7 out and back that's part of the Coas Trail that is literally just like the most random place in the entire world to add an extra 2.7 miles kind of. So yeah. it's, and it's like, uh, is it it's on, on the spreadsheet? Somebody added it. Somebody added it on the spreadsheet, but then didn't the spreadsheet came from somebody who was working on the red line years ago. And somebody took it and revamped it this last one or two years ago and have never said, Hey, Thanks. I know the person who did it and like who actually huh. made the, it, it's not made for you to redline. Like, Hey, yeah. if you finish the, the spreadsheet, you redlined. That's not true. Gotcha. You got to go through the guidebook because the spurs are on. There's certain things that are not on there and they've just started to like add things. Gotcha. That they choose to. Yeah. When I started <laughs> redlining, like for my attempt, I didn't know that part. Like, well, okay. <clears throat> back when I made my first edition of, <laughs> of my version of the spreadsheets, I didn't realize that all of it isn't on there. And I ended up having to sit down and go through the entire guidebook and add, my, create my own version with all the extra stuff. And that's why when people say like, oh, there's 653 trails and there's 1,420 miles of trails. No, that's not accurate. It's not an exact amount <laughs> because you're pulling that off a spreadsheet that's not exact. So, mm. and you have to also take into consideration if you want to get really, really specific all the spurs to every single view that is named and has a mileage add or a, a distance attached to it in the guidebook descriptions, the words underneath the little boxes. If you add every single one of those up and add that into the amount, like 
that's not going to total the amount in that spreadsheet because not all of those are added to the spreadsheet. So there's a lot of gray mm-hmm. area and a lot of um, misinformation out there. And it's interesting when you are in the fourth out or the redlining Facebook group, sometimes every now and again, you'll see comments and it's like, this person is not aware that the spreadsheet is not the end all be all. And even though there is a person who has currently been working on updating the spreadsheet over and over again, I've still found missed things when I'm going through because I've had to go through it with a fine tooth comb about 8,000 times <laughs> and <laughs> like add it, the things it's that wild. they've missed. Um, but there's like the one that we were just talking about. And then also if you want to get even more nuanced about it, the descriptions at the beginning of each section, there are trails like, um, what are those ones up in Northern New Hampshire, Daniel? The, de- the devil. Yep. Uh, by Nash stream. There's a couple trails. The, the Devil's Pool or oh, something. Oh, I've been there. Jacuzzi. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Devil's Jacuzzi. Yep, yeah, yeah. Mrs. Stomp and I went, and it was so ridiculous. She went in. It was absolutely freezing cold, as you would expect, and it was like room for one. And I just sort of like perched on a little rock and watched her and said, you having fun? Yeah, it was, yeah, so it was tough. So the descriptions at the beginning of each section, I actually asked Danielle because I didn't know, and she asked her friend, who te- who said I believe that they did do those, but it's not. It's like a gray area again, whether or not you have to do all these other. There's a whole bunch. I made. I have them in a spreadsheet that are not in those. They're, they're in a different part of the guidebook sections. Mm-hmm. So because there was somebody that said, well, I had to do. They're like, well, they listed the Cohos Trail with the mileage, so I thought I had to do that whole thing, and I was like, oh Lord. Like it's just, it's a lot of own, own interpretation and. Wow, I didn't know it was that. Like, um, <laughs> I, I just assumed that the spreadsheet is the no. Bible, but I no, guess no, that's no, not no, the case. No, 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 that is a <laughs> very, really? very you have wrong. To read the guidebook. <laughs> yes, and that's part of yeah, why. Like originally, when I started this whole nightmare slash exciting journey, um, <laughs> that's great. It was like very much something that I didn't want to ever publish my versions publicly of what I did. Like when, for example, if I wanted to submit for the fastest known time, if I actually did finish it, I would have to submit every GPX track and I have them all, (laughs) but it would be made public. So anybody could download them. And I was like, there's no way I'm doing that because that would give it, anybody could go on their website and just click download, 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 and then not even have to look at the guidebook. And Do the work. I'm like, no, this is way more than that. I did not spend three years slash four years of my life doing this exclusively for somebody to just download it off of a website. So, Yeah. Hey, uh, there are, um, final question for me. Are there awards by AMC for this effort? No. There aren't. Not for AMC. This so if you like the grid, so forty eight times twelve that website, yes. it's on there. It so is. Oh, okay. um, Ed Hawkins sends them out and it's through a fund. It's just like the, the fire tower list. I don't the hundred number fire tower list. Yes. Um it's okay. you actually don't get AMC doesn't do anything about the grid either. It's all of that website's so done by them. at the awards dinner next year, do you you want to join me and we can protest out front of the uh, Well, the I'll be there auditorium. to get my other stuff, but... <laughs> oh, can you come out and join me for the protest? Yeah, absolutely. All right, cool. All right, sounds good. <laughs> can we glue our hands to the... <laughs> to the, the, the middle school? <laughs> right. <laughs> Last question for me. So I feel like there's an interesting parallel here. So like, Danielle, you're cruising along and you're like, all right, I got the red line. Now I'm going to go for my grid. <laughs> Rebecca's sort of like, I got to get back to life here and, you know, need a little bit of time away. What about the burnout? What about the sort of keeping it um, so that it doesn't feel like a job? Can you talk about your perspective? I feel like you both have two different perspectives on this. So I'd be interested in hearing. And Rebecca, maybe if you want to go first, because I think, and I definitely picked it up on social media, like some of these last hikes were a grind for you. So can, can you talk a little bit about it? And then Danielle, I want to contrast her perspective with yours afterwards. So um, basically from, I would say, mid-June through till the end, it was a very, very difficult 
not only because of the fact that I was a year into doing this, but because of the weather. So we had the worst, rainiest, was it like the rainiest summer on record in years? Yep. And a lot of the hikes I had to do were hikes that were in areas that it was just like, I'm not going to do this because it's not safe or I can't cross that river because it's over my head. Um, so that was a very difficult. It was very demoralizing. And it was demoralizing to have to go out in the in the rain. And um, I do see a lot of the Facebook comments too uh, about, oh, I wish I could hike every day. And I literally want to be like, no, you don't, because I did. Not every day, <laughs> but on a very regular basis. And it's one thing I think <laughs> I've never through hiked, but I will say that having to do five hours a day of driving on top of a full day of hiking, and it's your job where you don't have the choice to stay home, is very, very hard. And it's I put 46 or 7,000 miles on my car in 194 days driving back and forth because I have a life. Like, I have to go home. I can't stay up there. And it was really, really hard, especially at the end. Um, my knees are just, were destroyed. My feet, I had ended up, Danielle actually saw, she was there probably one of the worst days I had on trail because she did my car spot. And I ended up coming out of the woods. My feet were rubbed beyond raw <laughs> and I was like I need to stop like I didn't spend or have a, th- a million dollars worth of medical bills and I'm not over exaggerating that's how much it cost for me to go through cancer treatment if I didn't have insurance to beat my body up like this so um it was really really hard at the end I didn't want to keep doing it I took 10 days off in a row in I think October and then I got a second wind and was like okay I have enough time I have a weather weather window to get these last three I think northern presidential hikes done before the, the winter really hits and I somehow managed to pull it off But there were a few times where I was like, I'm done and I'm going to put the rest off till next summer because I can't do it anymore. Um, It was just really, really, really hard. And um, at that point, I was still, I was working. Like I had, I couldn't say, okay, I'm not going to go to work today. I'm going to go hike because I have a responsibility. Like I had to work too. Um, But yeah, it was, it was a lot. It was something that I would never do again. Because it was just, it's not, it wasn't fun to to put myself through that at the end. Well, I think two things, Rebecca. One is your your calves must have been absolutely jacked by the end. <laughs> and then two, clearly like, you know, it's, I think there's something to be said about like just continuing to grind to, to complete a goal, even though it's tough. Like, oh, yeah. like there's something That's, about that. It's all about. I don't know what it is. <clears throat> no doubt. And now, meanwhile, we've got Danielle, who's like, "Yeah, I finished the red line. Now I'm going to grid." Like it's, it doesn't seem like you've lost the bug. <laughs> well, so. so like, um, she had a time frame. My time frame. I wanted to finish last year, but then I hiked the JMT and I did something else. And I did. Some, I like vacations. I like traveling. I like to see different places. Over the years, I've been like, what. What else am I adding to my bucket list? What other things can I see? So like the grid, like I have a hundred and I think 38 left. And it's just because I've been kind of wheeling away at everything. And so like red line, I was like, I am finishing it this year. So like anytime I had, like I have three days off a week unless I pick up overtime. Um, and so I get the same question that Rebecca gets of the, do you even work? And I'm like, you think I post about work? Mm-hmm. Why would I yeah. post about work? Like that's, that's a terrible <laughs> idea. Um, so I, I'm i on more of like the, hey, again, I don't want to go to the gym. Why don't I go hike a mountain? Hey, what can I do on this list? What can I do on that? Where can I see differently? Like I've not redlined Monadnock yet, so there is also that. I have, you know, there's just a bunch of things that I can continue to do. So I didn't really get burnt out on it. I know the driving, like I put 30 to 35,000 miles a year on my car and it's, it's not only from work, it's mostly from hiking and skiing and traveling. Um, so 
it's her, her time restraint was definitely I don't know if I could do that for sure like it, that's hard for anybody to be like oh well you have a job you have like you want this goal and your goal is to finish it so you have so many days a week you have to go out like I hiked a lot in the rain this year but it was more of like if I don't go out in the rain I'm not gonna hike so like I don't know how many times I hiked bomb back in the rain this year because I'm like well I need it for the grid might as well just go out and hike it with an umbrella <laughs> like <laughs> it's a purist yeah it was just it it was to get out but I knew which ones I could do with with the umbrella um like i knew i couldn't go out and be like hey let's go do the buttress trail in the rain it's funny like, you mentioned that you were the one that got me into umbrellas i love that umbrella yeah somebody on the at did they're like why do you have rain gear are you gonna sweat through it i was like yes yes i do and they're like how about an umbrella i was like mary poppins perfect let's do that it works great it does as long as you're not bushwagging because trees um yeah. but yeah so so there's i guess my i i didn't really get burnt out just because of I've been working on so many different things. Like I did, I did my New England, no, my Northeast 111 this year. Like I only had one hike left for that. Like it was, I kind of pieced together a bunch of things. Um, yeah. So it was easy, right. easier so not, for me to continue on. Yeah. You're not rushing. And honestly, that whole point you made about like, you know, the travel and getting outside of the area, like even like I went out to Mount Greylock and it was like a new experience for me. I do feel like it's sort of, refreshes you a little bit like and i know it's not you know not everyone it's it's expensive to take these trips but it is good to get out of new england or get out of new hampshire do some hiking in some other areas and then when you come back you appreciate it even more so it, that may be one of the, the tricks adirondacks. any yeah. of the adirondacks i came home and i was like the trails are amazing who thought of these here yeah when i get a little jaded i go to indian head resort <laughs> <laughs> Come <Yeah>. back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Clean slate, baby. All right, Stomp. Well, we ran out of time, so we're going to miss the search and rescue news, but we'll catch it up on the next episode here. But uh, this has been interesting. I, I'd, I'd rather go long and talk about this stuff than, than get to the search and rescue. We'll, we'll cover that in the next episode. So I apologize to the listeners. Yeah. So uh, how do we get a hold of you two online? Rebecca, what's the best way? Um, I would say just my Instagram, really. Stockton Hikes. I think I've plugged okay. it on here before. And then the new one is the New England Hiker. And the website's the New England Hiker.com. Okay, awesome. And Danielle? Uh, I'm on Facebook and Instagram, but I would say more Instagram, which would be 72 below D. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, awesome. Made that up a few years ago. Um, I am private, I am not public. So. As long as you're a hiker, I usually add you. Um, if you're some <laughs> okay. random person, I tend to not. Gotcha. Just, yeah. All right. That'd be great, Danielle. You meet some creepers from the Slasher podcast following Sweet. you. Sweet. <laughs> yes. Yeah, right, no right. All right. So before we close, I want to just recap here. So we've got two new lists that we found out about here. So we've got the scoops and loops. <laughs> And then what is the other one? It's something brews and what? View, views and brews. Views and brews. I'm going <laughs> to so link these. And then we've got the Fousey phone case. Yeah. And um, then Rebecca has the most jack calves in the world. <laughs> yeah. And Danielle used to be young. I used to be young. <laughs> right? oh, thank you, Mike. <laughs> I'm sorry. 29 forever. What is that? I missed that part. <laughs> oh, you can re-listen. You'll catch it. <laughs> okay. All right. 29 and, forever. Yeah. And then um, <laughs> the cats have thoroughly crawled all over Danielle and poisoned her, so she'll be... <laughs> She'll be blind when she touches her eyes, but uh, but this has been <laughs> yep. great. So thank you, ladies, and uh, you know we'll have this out on uh, on Friday, so we'll uh, yeah. look forward to catching up again in the future awesome thanks for having us cool, cool. yes thank you you bet thank you for listening if you enjoyed the show you can subscribe on apple podcasts spotify podbean youtube or wherever you listen to podcasts if you want to learn more about the topics covered in today's show, please check out the show notes and safety information at slasherpodcast.com. That's S-L-A-S-R podcast.com. You can also follow the show on Facebook and Instagram. 
We hope you'll join us next week for another great show. Until then, on behalf of Mike and Stomp, get out there and crush some mega peaks. Now covered in scratches, blisters, and bug bites, Chris Staff wanted to complete his most challenging day hike ever. Fishing game officers say the hiker from Florida activated an emergency beacon yesterday morning. He was hiking along the Appalachian Trail when the weather started to get worse. Officials say the snow was piled up to three feet in some spots and there was a wind chill of minus one degree. And there's three words to describe this race. Do we all know what they are? Lieutenant James Nealon, New Hampshire Fishing Game. Lieutenant, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me. What are some of the most common mistakes you see people make when they're heading out on the trails to hike here in New Hampshire? It seems to me the most common is being unprepared. And I think if they just simply visited uh, hikesafe.com and got a list of the 10 essential items and had those in their packs, they probably would have no need to ever call us at all.